This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E dot com. Hey everybody, listen up. I got I got mega huge news. Meat Eater Live is heading back out on the road. That's right. Join me and the crew talking Clay Newcomb, Cal, Yanni, Spencer's gonna be there. Phil, Phil the engineer is gonna be there. Meat Eater Live headed back out. Now, when you get every ticket, okay, every ticket you buy, you get a signed copy of our new Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook. This tour is celebrating the release of the book. Buy a ticket, get a signed copy, Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook, Wild Game Recipes for the Grill, Smoker, Camp Stove, and Camp Fire, which I'll point out is a $38 value. Here's where we're going to go. April 23rd, the Mesa Art Center in Mesa, Arizona. April 24, the Balboa Theater in San Diego. April 25, the Grove in Anaheim, California. April 27, the Crest Theater in Sacramento. April 29, The Union in Salt Lake City. April 30, The Egyptian in Boise. May 1, The Wilma Theater in Missoula. May 2, The Bing Crosby Theater in Spokane, Washington. May 4, Revolution Hall in Portland, Oregon. And May 5, the last day of the tour, Pantages Theater in Tacoma, Washington. For tickets and more information, visit the events page at the Meat Eater. Dot com. If we're not coming to your neck of the woods and you still want to get your hands on a signed copy of our new Meat Eater Outdoor Cookbook, go to signedoutdoorcookbook.com or check out Barnes & Noble online. Hope to see you at the show. Welcome, everybody. We got two shows in one today because uh, we're joined by Dan Gates. Um, to talk about what's going on. The, the topic, as Corinne wrote it, is what's going on in Colorado? Um, <laughs> we're going to get into what's going on in Colorado, which if you're a Coloradan, how do you like to say that, Brody? Coloradan? Coloradan. If you're a Coloradan, <laughs> um, you'll especially want to stay tuned. But if you're just a general American, you'll want to stay tuned as well because what we're going to talk about going on in Colorado has implications <laughs> for what's going on in America. Um <laughs> So stay tuned for that. But first, the, the the first part of the show, and then we're gonna we're gonna hear um we're gonna hear a little bit from Giannis about a, a recent adventure. Uh, Ryan Callahan's here. Brody Henderson's here. Randall, Doctor Randall's here with a brand new haircut. Been cutting his own hair. Yep. Learn how to cut his own hair. What, learning to cut my own. Learning hair. to cut yeah, his own. He's hair. gonna take us through that process step by step. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're actually doing a video series. <laughs> I love it. And. Uh, the the star of the show part one. Remember, I said this is two shows in one. The star of show part one is is Connor Smith. How old are you, Connor? Sixteen. Sixteen. Connor Smith's sixteen years old. Um, his mother Alyssa is a colleague of ours, and he I've been hearing about this. Mm -hmm. Killed himself, a big old bull. Yeah, it's uh... at a Christmas party. Your mom showed me a picture of it. <laughs> And normally people are showing me pictures of big bulls. That is just in one ear and out the other. But I took note because, uh, um, one, because you're her kid and not like the neighbor's cousin's friend, mm -hmm. which is a lot of the big bulls you see. And two, because you kind of, you did it real scrappy like. Yeah. 39th biggest bull ever killed in Montana. About, yeah. What do you mean about? <laughs> Might get kicked out. Oh, you're going to get kicked out? My dad wants to shoot one bigger than me. Oh! <laughs> I thought you meant there was a, like a legal problem you were faced with or something. Like it wasn't seasoned or something. No. Oh, so you're legit. Okay, yeah. tell me. Now, you were telling me the story earlier and I cut you off because you got to the part about your gun stopping working. And that's not a thing I usually hear about uh, firearms. So yeah. how did your, tell, tell me your gun layout here. Well, I had a 300 that, or we have two 300s, one that my grand, we were both my grandfather gave me and... So your parents are tight. Yeah. And you, got a, you got two old grandpa guns. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm picturing. And uh, the first one I've been using for a couple of years now, it's like, I don't know how old it is, but we uh, brought it to the shooting range and 
it just kept shooting like inconsistently. Got it. Like I think there's something wrong with uh, chambering, is what my grandfather keeps keeps telling me. Mm-hmm. So so it's deep within the bowels of the gun. It's not yeah. like a loose scope mount or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, a week before the hunt, I had a change to my dad's. That's now or my granddad's. That's now my dad's. And then I used that for the hunt. So you, these are 300 win mags. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, so then you got tuned in. And I'd, I'd probably call it like yours now because it's not like anybody else wants to use that gun because it's like you got the biggest bowl with it. Yeah. Well, maybe it's got good mojo. So well, yeah, juju, whatever that might be. It does, but it might just be Connor's though. Yeah. yeah. So Gramps, Gramps passes down one gun to you and one gun to his kid, your dad. Yeah. Okay. And then you get the one that Gramps now thinks is shoddy. Mm-hmm. So you take the old man's gun. Yeah. Okay. And then you got to have a spot where you're going hunting. So talk, talk me through that. Don't give me the spot, but mm-hmm. like, tell me through your, your process here. Well, I've, uh, going into last year, I had, uh, three points and my dad put me in for a uh, special pull elk tag. And, uh, I got you with three bonus points. Yeah. 11% chance odds. Um, te- you see Cal's getting excited now. Mm-hmm. Cal likes any story about youngsters with lots of points drawn, sweet tags, man. <laughs> Taking opportunities <laughs> away from him. That's, yep. that's yep. his favorite. Yep. That's his absolute favorite genre of story. I know, but man. you know, I, talking, uh, talking with your mother, I know that uh, the family put some sweat equity in out there. So uh, you're, yeah, you're doing so it wasn't right. just yeah. told, okay, continue yeah. on. His dad just, didn't just... drag him out of like band class that he'd rather be at mm, because right. his dad did all the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so just, okay, I'm sorry to mean interrupt. So you got you got into a special unit. Yeah, and uh, um, I like got home from school one day and- Oh, back up. You, yeah. you, you didn't do any scouting or anything? Well, we've been scouting out there before, okay. and uh, I got home, and my dad showed me the draw odds, and I drew the tag. Gotcha. Okay. And roughly, what were the odds of you drawing the tag? Do you remember? 11%. 11%. Got it. All right. Got it. Yeah. So it's the area you're, you're familiar with? Very familiar with. Oh. Well, how's this? How well, are you very familiar? We've been hunting out there a couple times. So family members have drawn? Well, not really. Just we've been like shed hunting out there. And okay. like scouting for an elk tag. Oh, cool. just pre-scout, just in case. Yeah. Just getting familiar with the area. Yeah. Got exactly. it. Okay. Okay. So then what happens? Uh, well, we scouted all the summer, through the summer, spring and all that. And, mm-hmm. um. Like you kept going up there and checking in on it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And we found a couple sheds and yeah, going into the season, uh, we went a couple days before and- uh, we saw a bull, a really nice bull. It was a big five point actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we scouted him, put him to bed and waited for the morning, opening morning. And, uh, we woke up that morning. Um, did you have a goal? It's like how big of a bull you're looking for or basically the first, uh, solid bull I found. Awesome. And, that you know, have gold. you killed some bulls before? Yeah, I was saying before uh, he's got two. I've killed two bulls and one cow. Sweet. What? Yeah. Sweet, sweet. Doing what? Just uh regular <laughs> just regular. Time. Regular hunting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And did any of those come uh during the youth season when you could yeah, there's no youth season? There's no elk. youth elk. Oh, is it's just deer, just deer and mm-hmm. birds and turkeys. Dude, if there was youth elk. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. I'd be having more kids. <laughs> well, that, that's my other. That's I would have never other. gotten the vasectomy. <laughs> that's, my other, that's, that's my other fun. Yeah. Uh, have have Ma and Pa t- uh, coached you up properly on on how these conversations can go and how not to give away your landmarks? And he's doing super hunting. good. Yeah. So yeah. He's doing good. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. cryptic. I got nothing to go off. Mm-hmm. Um, well, no, I do. Three <laughs> points, 11% odds. A real sharp feller. I shouldn't have pointed that out. Yeah, no, you've <laughs> done more. <laughs> <laughs> Someone real sharp on math with a sharp pencil. Go on. And uh, Ble- bleep all that out, Phil. <laughs> we uh, <laughs> we watched this bowl all mo- all opening morning. Just the five point. Yeah. What do you mean watched it? Why not go get it? Because you're just holding off. Yeah, there was some other competition in the area too. Just like there was a lot of like ravines and stuff that these bowl this elk herd could have gone there so we just watched them and we're trying to 
watch where they were going to so get So he bad. was with other, he wasn't solo, he was with other elk. Yeah, What's was, competition mean? From hunters? Hunters, yeah. I see, okay. And uh, we watched these bulls, we like rushed up, or this bull and like this group of cows, and we watched them for a little bit, ran over to like where we thought they were going to come out at, and... Uh, and you're hunting with your old man? Yeah. Is Gramps there? No. Okay. Just my dad and my little brother. Okay. And uh your little brother's how old? He is 14, 13. Is he much help? He's a little a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't feel bad about not knowing ages. I just give a height on most <laughs> most younger folks. So mm-hmm. yeah. And uh we watched these uh elk come out of this like ravine. I think the first opportunity I had was at like five hundred twenty three yards at this five point. You're so precise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And now uh, people are going to know exactly where he was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> watched him. We watched him for a little bit. I thought I could get closer, and he ended up going into the timber uh-huh. out of sight. So we had to wrap around and see if we could find him again. And uh, we uh, we didn't know where they went. We thought they crossed the way and stuff. And uh, we kind of just walked around, and we heard a bugle. Hmm. Heard a bugle like maybe. 50 yards from us and what time of day it's about it was about like maybe seven eight ish 50 yards away yeah and uh they definitely spooked because we heard some running in the trees and stuff and also maybe the cows spooked and that made the bull bugle because he's like where's everybody going kind of yeah. thing okay yeah. and uh we kind of just followed those tracks up this little hmm. this little hillside and um we topped the ridge and there was just a bowl like in the middle of like all these trees. There's like one open patch and just a bowl or just the bowl? The bowl. All and right. Then, um, <laughs> not the five point. Not the five point. Whole different bowl. Yeah, whole well, different. Didn't know even know about him, but he's the one that ripped a bugle. Pro- Pres- we presumably. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. And just like in the middle of like this, all these trees, there's like one little open patch of like. Uh, grass and stuff and mm-hmm. he was just standing there and I told my uh, pa- my dad and my little brother to get down and you told them to get down yeah they you didn't, spotted it yeah they didn't see it huh okay and uh, my so you dad got to go to your dad get down yeah, yeah. he kept he tried, that, that had to feel good he tried to keep walking he didn't he didn't, yeah. he didn't believe me <laughs> smack him on the shoulder <laughs> yeah get down yeah yeah That's and how you do it uh, he got out the spotting scope and I'm kind of sat up on this rock with my gun like looking at the bull and he was like it's at 689 yards oh. and I was like I got a whole another week of the hunt might as well try to pull the trigger and uh home it back up that that contradicts <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no did, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking you have a whole nother week of the hunt so might as well pull the trigger yeah if I miss then oh I got okay. like an, I got enough <laughs> I got another week because I could hear you finishing that sentence by saying, uh, we got a whole other week of the hunt. Let's mm-hmm. not pull the trigger. So well, let's not pull the trigger. Yeah. Let, let's wait. Mm-hmm. So you're like, we got a whole other week of the hunt, so let's take a shot. Yeah. yeah. Are you a holdover guy or are you dialing? Uh, holdover. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, and it's then what a, happens? It's like a little Christmas tree scope. It's uh-huh. got, what is it, five notches on it. Yep. The farthest it goes is 600, but there's like this little notch at the very end that I use for 700. Okay. And, uh, so you do a little bit of long, long distance shooting. No, that was the first no. time I've ever shot that far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so I missed the first shot and the bull just stood there like nothing happened. Okay. And I, you're using your little extra post. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? Um, my dad's like, shoot again, shoot again. Did, could he see where you hit? Yeah. He was like, you missed high. And I was like, okay, I got to readjust for wind and all that. And, uh, Shot again, high backed him, and his like back legs dropped, and he just kind of stood there again. And my dad's like, "Load another one and shoot," and I did, and it double lunged him. Bam! And, yeah, he kind of walked off to the trees and bedded down after that. And then what happened? Uh, we walked up to him, and he was dead. Yeah, just laying there. And at what point did you go like, "My goodness, that's a big old bull"? Uh, when I got walked up to him, I didn't. When I shot, I didn't see like how big he was. I saw like the back whale tail and just was like, that's enough for me to see how big yep. it is. No ground shrinkage. 
No. <laughs> he had ground growage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, that's not the five point. The uncommon <laughs> ground growage. Yeah. 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 And uh we walked up to it and we we kind of la- talked about it. We thought it was in the three seventy range. Uh-huh. And uh we got it scored a couple weeks ago at three eighty seven net and then three ninety three gross. Oh. Mm. That's wild. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> That's all wild. Right. Dismissed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See you later. Yeah. Nice Gave us a whole lot to think about, Connor. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've killed. I've killed two bulls that would that would fit under that three ninety. Like you could mark. add them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The other dude wouldn't get there. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. So now you realize here's the problem you're going to face now as you grow older. You might. Already, you probably already got the biggest elk you'll ever get. You realize that? Yeah. Okay. You comfortable with that? Yeah. I've been told by a lot of people that. People like to point that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it mostly older people that point that out? Yeah. Okay. All like, I think some of them are sitting around the table I, right now. I did in the hallway out yeah, there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes older people feel better. Mm-hmm. I've been told I'm ruined for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, There's, let me give you a piece of advice. We had a dude. There's a dude that uh, named Dustin Huff that was on the show, and he killed, uh, I think it's, what is it, the biggest typical. Typical whitetail? Biggest typical whitetail in America, meaning not in Canada. Yeah. Okay? Because there's a bigger one there. Mm-hmm. He's number two on the continent. So number two on the continent, number one in America, which is what really matters, right? Yeah. We're all mm-hmm. Americans here. Mm-hmm. Um, he... uh. When he set out that day, he set out to kill, he was like, my goal was to kill a personal best. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a personal best for him, I can't remember. He had killed like a 130 whitetail. So he was looking for a personal best. Mm -hmm. So then he kills this thing that, you know, will never be seen again. Yeah. And I said, well, what is your attitude now? Because you're like a personal best hunter. And he said, I'm going to go back to where I was before I killed that buck. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so he had to just you know ignore that one and then mm-hmm. plow ahead yeah which is probably how you're going to want to approach things yeah it'd be like your rifle range right where <laughs> you get a nice group and then there's one that flies off to the side yeah and you just kind of that's an outlier you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you're shooting and you go home after a good shot you're like, I'm not going to shoot again because I might have one of them strays and then I have to go home feeling worried. Yeah. You could also just get really into uh, general tag hunting. Mm-hmm. You have your, your draw best and you have your general tag That's best. That's a good way to look at it too. He's got time to draw all kinds of good mm-hmm. tags. Mm-hmm. Sheep, goat, moose, all that stuff. But you saw some other hunters. Yeah. You're hunting on public land. Yes or no? Yeah. Hunting on public land. Saw some other hunters. Yeah. Killed what, a giant What was bull. the elevation? Oh, I, well, can't, I couldn't remember that. Yeah, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Congratulations, man. Where Thank is the you. bull? Uh, it's in my garage right now. You can get it stuffed? The hide's at the taxidermist right now. Huh. So you are getting it stuffed. Yeah, we're going to get it shoulder mounted. Where are you nice. going to hang it? Uh, probably like living room. You got a place big enough for that? We talked about it. We have to move a mount, a full body mountain goat for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your dad's Get out goat. of the way. <laughs> Whose mountain goat is it? My dad's. Yeah. <laughs> sure he doesn't take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, if you run out of room, you can hang it down here in the office. I might have to do that. Well, man, we'll put a little plaque up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nobody's going to walk in the house and talk about dad's goat anymore. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like, well, what's that? <laughs> Who's paying to get it stuffed? Uh, my parents. That's nice. Though, that is yeah. nice. Yeah. Who are you going to have stuff it? Do you know yet? Uh, it's a guy down in uh, Belgrade. It's uh, Terry Sure. He does good work? Yeah, he does a good job. You vetted him? Yeah. Good he's, man. He's done uh, my dad's mountain goat, and uh, he's done my dad's mule deer. Well, a lot of those guys are weirdos, man. Taxidermists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've even I even talked about that with taxidermists. <laughs> no, he's a yeah, They know. agree. Oh, yeah. He's a but fun- they're like, not me, but they're like, yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a funny guy, though. Is he? Yeah. Funny, like good. Yeah, he's 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 fun <laughs> he, to talk to. He's humorous. To. Yeah. Got it. Great. Well, thanks for coming in, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Congratulations. Thanks. That's pretty great. Yeah. You can head out this year, obviously. Mm-hmm. You turkey man? Yeah. Okay. You like the fish? Yeah. Okay. 
let us know next time something good happens to you. But it's shed oh, hunting season. Like that's that's what these guys do. If you're I'm... into that. Oh yeah. That wasn't a thing when I was a kid. Was you picked, it? You picked them up, and no one had a word for it. Mm-hmm. You just found an antler. <laughs> <laughs> no one like went anywhere to find an antler. Just yeah. if you found one, you brought it home. Mm-hmm. Everyone was a shed hunter. They just didn't know it. Yeah. There's no term for it. You they didn't I mean? have dogs. Yeah. No. They didn't know. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, parkour. You know, people used to just jump off trash cans <laughs> and stuff like that. And <laughs> somebody have, called it parkour. They didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, next time you get have something good, or if something real bad happens, you come check us out. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear it. Next year, I want you to come down and talk about getting your ass kicked at something. Oh, I probably will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try archery hunting this year. Okay, nice. so come tell us about missing one or hitting one in the leg and can't yeah. find it. There won't come be any 600-yard shots with that. I'll, tell <laughs> you that so. I'll probably miss high on one. Yeah, he'd be like, well, it was 83 yards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy, thanks. You going to stick yeah. around? I'll stick, stick around, yeah. Where are you supposed to be? You in school still, obviously? Yeah. What grade you in? Junior. Okay. But you got excused? No, I'm just playing hooky. <laughs> what, uh, He's sick today. He's at the dentist. What school are you at? Uh, Bozeman High. Where's that at? I think that's it's, the one my kid's going to. It's yeah. the it's the old one. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah, my kid will be down yeah. next year. Oh. He'll like all that stuff about yardages and calibers. That's mm-hmm. their that's like his peer group. That's what they're interested in. Yeah. He'll be like, Johnny shot a elk at six hundred and twenty yards with a and I'm like, Where? Where are they? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> was it a big bull i don't know <laughs> everything is calibers and distances uh all right yanni you're gonna tell us something yeah you're gonna share are we, share gonna, co- are we gonna co-tell the yeah, story yeah, i'll chip you were there i'll chip in uh, i had a lot of people at, i was just just got back from pheasant fest a lot of people asking about how old mingus is doing yeah, I don't know where. We must have talked about it somewhere else or someone did because word got out. It I got mentioned. It was, on, it was really mentioned talk. briefly trivia. on trivia, trivia and we kind of danced around it on a, the last Meat Eater mm-hmm. episode. Uh, oh, hey, let me tell you something that Pat said first. Pat Durkin. Uh-huh. Pat Durkin wrote in, Hi, Stephen Crin. I enjoyed the Meat Eater podcast with CJ Box, especially the shots at copy editors, probably because I am one. He goes on, I'm sure you know Samuel Clemens, that's Mark Twain to you, uh, Ill, uh, not illiterate, not literary <laughs> folks. <laughs> I'm sure you know Mark Twain didn't like editors either. Oh, oh, I see what he's doing here. He uses Samuel Clemens and then uses Mark Twain. Um, I keep this Mark Twain quote taped above my desk. It's from a 1906 letter to Henry Mills Alden and was printed in the Chicago Daily Tribune. Twain says, How often we recall with regret that Napoleon once shot at a magazine editor and missed him and killed a publisher. But we remember with, cl- with clarity, no, but we remember with charity that his intentions were good. <laughs> <laughs> And he says, also, don't bury outdoor newspaper columnists yet. Please wait till I die. I'm still cranking out my weekly column for eight Wisconsin newspapers. I started the column in 1984 while at the Oshkosh Daily Northwestern and haven't missed a week since. I also posted on my website for the freeloaders. Last of a dying breed. Yeah, we were talking about like mm-hmm. like when you were a kid, you had like the dude yeah. at the Muskegon Chronicle. I wish I could remember his name, Bob. Something. Every Sunday, you're like excited to open the paper. You know, he'd profile a taxidermist. He'd be like, "They're getting big perch." Yep, you know, off of the Lake Michigan Pier. The next week, it'd be here's a great venison meatloaf recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Just every Saturday, man, and that was like the only outdoor media we took in. Yep, was that dude's column. Well, I wonder if even there is an outdoor section i haven't gotten a newspaper in so long but i remember like the the gazette kalamazoo gazette had an outdoor section it's on saturday yeah which is weird because saturday's the day you're hunting and fishing yeah a lot of papers have gotten rid of them. billings i think still has one yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i talked to an outdoor guy at one of the papers and um he was not happy about digital media i can tell you no. that all right yanni go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple actually i think it's three weeks ago now uh, Steve and I took uh, our kids on a little snowmobiling cat hunting adventure. Mm-hmm. 
And um, not long into our morning, really, probably less than an hour into our snowmobiling adventure, uh, you cut a fresh bobcat track. And we had incredibly fresh snow. Yeah, real fresh snow. Real fresh snow. Like it had probably only quit snowing right at daylight or maybe even after. And so any, you know, track that we were going to cut was going to be pretty fresh. And this sucker, I mean, it might've been filled in a little bit crossing the road, but as soon as it went under any kind of a tree, Mm -hmm. you could see it was, it was crisp and clean. And so we cut Mingus loose on it. And, uh, Steve and I've been trying to do this for a couple of years now. Yeah. We go seven, seven people and one dog. Yeah. Go go (laughs) hunt with Mingus. And, uh, it's a, uh, is that right? Seven people? Yeah, me and my three. I had all three of my kids. Yeah. Yeah. I had two. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot to think about when you're going to put together that kind of a uh, an adventure because uh, it's not just like you and me going looking for a lion track. Uh, there's, you know, five people that are depending on us and, you know, you bring in sustenance for them and extra clothes because they're going to, you know, First thing we do when they when you stop the snowmobiles and are looking at a fresh track, they're like, "Yeah, that's interesting," and then they just start like doing parkour off the edge of the <laughs> Forest Service road into the snow, and they're fighting, just throwing, covered and in crying, snow, and, and, and yeah. everybody's like the, soaking wet. Oh, yeah. cool! It's like no shit. It, all, all, all the snowmobiling goggles are just packed full of snow, worthless at this point. Whitewashing each other, whatever, man. It's like, um. This comes. This is part of the story because that morning, um, I had looked at the pack. I had been using a a pack that Paul had made for me. It's kind of a, just a day hunting pack. It's not really meant to pack meat. Mm. And uh, I thought, you know, with all these kids and knowing where we were going, there's not a lot of roads. We might end up on a long walk, and I'll be carrying all kinds of gear, water, food, whatever. So I should go to a bigger pack. And so I swapped out and just grabbed my like a exo pack that has more of a frame to it, you know? Anyways, um, we cut Mingus loose on the track and, um, he's what I would call smoking it, moving it very quickly. He makes it, you know, 600 yards as a crow flies from us. in I don't know, 10 minutes, maybe mm-hmm. not that. Um, we gotta and, make, gotta make the noise. What's that? Well, the, well, the noise he's making. Oh, when Mingus is on track. <laughs> well, I kept saying, well, what's that noise mean? What's that noise mean? And he's like, he likes it. He doesn't love it. <laughs> he hasn't seen it. Right? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it, it's a steady ball. It, Mingus's bark is very hard to replicate um, because he kind of balls, and then at the end of it, his voice almost cracks and breaks, and it almost sounds like you're taking... Uh, like newspaper on a window. If you're watching it, and it's like that. Oh, help. right at the end. Um, it's a funny sound. I don't and know. He if was I explaining can to me the noise. Away. If it sees it, then it's a different noise. Well, once once he sees it in the tree, yeah, then it changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. the, the, mm-hmm. It's a yeah. different sound. Well, yeah, he'd go into three long, like locate balls, which are very deep, very low, and then he would just go into a constant chop. So anyways, he's crossed, we're on one side of a drainage and he's crossed the drainage, crossed the creek and he's gotten up on a, I guess that hill would be south facing, right? It's way more open. There's not as yeah, many south. trees. You're right, it's south. And it looks steep to me. There's some cliffs over steep. there. Steep, it's like a, it's a band of cliffs. Um, <laughs> It's like, no, it's like you go down, we're on a timbered slope. Yeah. And you go down and you got a big scree field. Yeah, and then like all the cliff faces that all the scree had been breaking off. Sure, but he obviously went geology there. You see, I slipped a little geology in there. Nice work. But he's (laughs) the whole thing wasn't a cliff face because he was able to get above the cliff bands. Bands, yeah. He was able to pretty easily work through the trees that the bobcat had taken, Mm -hmm. and bobcats are known for evading dogs like while the chase is actually going on. Right, a lion really doesn't have that op- option because it doesn't have the stamina to stay out ahead of dogs. It's a very short uh, chase, usually a couple hundred yards, and the lion gives up because it, it just its lungs are burning and it has to, you know, go up a tree. Uh, can I can I tell yeah. you a thing that you told me while we were doing this? Mm-hmm. Uh, he went down into a creek bottom where you could picture like a cat running, but then all of a sudden he left the creek bottom and went up and we thought, oh, I mean, he might already know because the track was so fresh. He might already know there's a dog after him. 
And Yanni was talking to a houndsman who was saying he's seen cats eluding dogs and actually stop, get out on a cliff and be sitting there licking their paws, yeah. just looking, waiting. looking down where they know that. <laughs> Cause they, and you think about it, they probably deal with this all the time. Like they're on a kill and some coyotes come like, Oh brother, climb up a tree. Right. Or, or around here in, in some areas be like, there's wolves to deal with. So they just get like, Oh yeah. I'm going to climb a tree and then hang out. And wait yeah. It's till, part of that. Wait till this thing leaves me alone and then I'll go about my business. It's probably like a, <laughs> somewhat casual occurrence to elude a can to, to get out of a canine's way. Sure. It's part of daily life, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, I've some houndsmen say that they think that when they've glassed those cats sitting there, it almost looks like they're having fun, mm. which <laughs> that's a little too, too much anthropomorphization, I think to the, to the situation. But anyways, uh, yeah, we were, you had just mentioned about how it's like looking pretty cliffy, like too cliffy. And I'm like, yeah, but he's hunting that kind of stuff all the time. You know, and I was just like, I wasn't worried until you said something. And if you're watching the GPS, especially when they're on these bobcat tracks, it's just squiggly lines, squiggly lines, squiggly lines. And so he's in this copse of evergreens. And we can't, he's only 600 yards away, but we can't see him. There's fresh snow. Mingus is pretty much a black and white dog. He blends in very well on, on snow. And uh, so we're trying to find it, but we can't. And I'm just watching the GPS and uh, squiggly lines, squiggly lines. And then you said, he went quiet. And you're like, well, what is he doing now? You know? And I'm like, eh, he must have lost it. You know? And he's just like really having to focus. And he doesn't have that fresh scent in his nose. And that's why he's not balling. And like, the, the pause went on long enough to where I'm like, oh, I better look at the GPS again and see what is going on. And I look at the GPS and he had made a short run out of that copse of trees to the I don't left. Know, looker's left yeah. and gotten above those cliffs. And then there's a straight line from the top of those cliffs to the bottom of those cliffs. And then the GPS is showing treed. So when you have your a Garmin set on a ha- for a hound dog, when they stop moving, it'll basically give you a treed signal so that if you're out of earshot and you know your hound stopped moving, he's on chase, he's probably at the tree with the cat. Well, in this case, we knew he wasn't at a tree with the cat. He was simply not moving and he wasn't barking anymore after being on a super hot track. And so we immediately knew something was up. Oh, yeah. It was without a doubt. That he had taken a fall. Yeah. And so we... uh and I figured, well... Um, you know, he's like stone dead at the bottom of a cliff. Oh yeah. Which, I, yeah, I, I thought that was going to be the same deal. That I felt bad. Extreme... I felt bad. I felt bad for you. But I mainly was like, man, Yanni's daughters love that dog so mm. much. This is just going to, this is just going to be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> like a horrible day. <laughs> and we should touch on that later too, you know, at the end of the story, because I still go back and forth. I've been called a monster already at my house because I've brought up this, uh, this idea of like uh, the different ways that it could have turned out, Mm -hmm. you know, and so like 50 years ago, or maybe not even that long, 20, 30 years ago, this veterinary care that we have so available to us wasn't. And if you had a situation like that, you'd be like, well, that's a bummer. And you would just have to like what do you shoot walk, that dog. What do you walk over there? <laughs> well, no, you'd walk over I'm, I'm there, joking, right? Got to get your collar back. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> girls, I'll be back with the collar. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, obviously in my head, I'm thinking like, how is this all going to go down with the kids? Mm. How are they going to deal with it? And part of me thinks that I don't want to say it'd be better, but it certainly wouldn't hurt them in life to have gone through the other ver the other outcome that could have been from that day. Oh yeah, you know to go through the had, loss. They wouldn't have had different lives. No, not wouldn't at all. Wouldn't have been like losing a parent. No, but in the know. moment, yeah. it sure feels like that. The pressure you're feeling. So, uh, we uh, I empty out that backpack that I was just talking about earlier. Take out. And it's funny because I was packing. Yeah, you took your pistol out. A ten millimeter on my uh, hip, and. Uh, and I had a 22 mag in the backpack in case we found a cat that we wanted to shoot. A 10 millimeters for in case things get Western. And uh, I purposely took them both out because I thought if we go over there, 
and that dog has to be put down, I, I can't do it within earshot of those girls because if they hear me shoot that dog, then they'll never forgive me. You know, so I left both <laughs> things there. I don't know what we we're going to do. No, Maybe on the way down, I said, well, to... I, I said, you got your pistol, right? Yeah. And you're like, no, I didn't want them to hear us shoot. Yeah. We would have had to let his blood out with a yeah. knife or something. I don't and we know. told the kids, All the you hypotheticals guys... are making this so much worse. <laughs> well, yeah. We yeah. told yeah. the kids. <laughs> well, dude, that's the story, we told man. All stay, we yeah. told them to yeah. all stay put. So we told yeah. all five, we're going to stay put. We're going to go down and cross the canyon. Did you guys let side. that, were the kids aware that, that something was yeah, wrong? Yeah, Yanni said the dog might be hurt. Okay. Mm. I, yeah, mm. but they, they were having fun. Like, like I said, we had just, we had, we had moved the snowmobiles closer to where he had, where he was. They were having fun. This is before we realized he got hurt. They were having fun throwing right. snow, chasing each other around. And so we're like, Mingus, you know, is, might need a little hand. We're going to go check in on him. You guys just hang out, build a fire, eat some snacks. They weren't really aware no. at, at all of that. We, we didn't, certainly didn't show him the GPS right. track. So Steve and I bail down uh, off this Forest Service road, and uh, I don't know, what do you think we drop? Thousand feet, maybe not yeah, quite maybe. to the creek bottom. I could tell you exact. Deep, oh. s- deep snow, a lot of fallen trees, and um, I felt like we were just hopping a lot of trees, which on the way down wasn't wasn't too bad. Cross the creek, and uh, you know, base are able to walk right to him, and Steve actually spotted him first. And yeah, this uh, is something I've been wanting to ask you about. I'm trying to I'm looking at the spot. I said, I was out a little bit in front of you, and I said, his head's up. And you looked, I couldn't tell if you were relieved or upset that his head was up. You looked like you were uh, upset that his head was up. No, I mean, I, honestly, I couldn't tell you if what kind of, at that point, what kind of emotions I was feeling. I was just feeling really guilty for letting him get into that position you know understood heavy responsibility situation too right like yeah, yeah there's you got a lot going on yep so uh it was good to see him with his head is up with his head up we knew he's alive um but we get to him and he's kind of he likes to sit in what we call I mean, a lot of dogs sit in that kind of sphinx position um he does it extremely well and and looks very handsome when he does it sometimes he crosses his front paws mm, but he's but he's in that position on a scree slope facing uphill and he can obviously hear us coming but he's not looking over his shoulder you know he's like mm. just looking one way and we get up there to him and kind of start poking and prodding and like he's not reacting to anything we do like you can pull his legs out and he's they're just kind of loose and floppy and you know He's Little not, holes all over him. He's not look. Yeah, lacerations just covering his body, and he's not like. You know, you can put your whatever. You could kind of yell at him, and he wasn't reacting to. And us a big old blood there. trail coming down the hill. Yeah, like he landed probably fifty yards above that, and uh, it looked as though if you had shot a deer up there, and then it had rolled down in the blood. You know, it was kind of that scene. Mm-hmm. I hiked up there real quick just to see, kind of get an idea of what he had gone through and where he landed. We probably had what, four to six inches, Mm -hmm. maybe a fresh, but not nothing underneath it. Very poor snow conditions, um, in general, uh, for the winter around here. But, uh, when he landed, you know, the impact had shot snow probably six feet either direction. I mean, it was a big bomb. You can see it from way off. Yeah. And, uh, it's like between two, cliff faces, there was a little bit of a shoot, and I thought, well, maybe he could have come down through that, but there was no disturbed snow. So obviously he came off one of the cliff faces. I'd like to go back and actually hit it with the rangefinder to know, but I just remember looking up there and just for to have some sort of um, comparison or context, I thought, I've never jumped off of anything that high on skis. And like, I'd probably be too scared to jump off of that on skis, even on the you know deepest powder day. So you ski a lot, you know, you probably jumped off some stuff. Oh, but also you probably just do like too, your, right, Connor? Your dead no, animal you're not experience. Jump off stuff? <laughs> no. <laughs> your, your dead animal experience there too, right? Of like seeing that tumble down in, in the snow means something to us mm-hmm. that if you don't have the prior experience of recovering game, it doesn't, doesn't mean as much, right? So you're, 
yeah, you're you're adding up uh, all your your data points right now and being trying to come up with the proper conclusion. Yeah. So we'll ha- we'll never know how he came off the the uh, the cliff. My best guess is that where he went up, the grade of the hill was enough that he had good footing. And then I think that as he wrapped the hill going left, the grade just it just increased to the point where it got really steep and the cat kept going and the snow got slick and eventually he just lost footing and, and, and couldn't, you know, yeah. couldn't, couldn't turn around and just went careening off a 40 footer is what I guessed it at. He too, if you put your, I put my ear against his chest and it was like, <sighs> right. And I thought, cause I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I thought it was later found out what it was, but I thought yeah. it was blood. In his chest. Just because I don't know, you know, it's like a real gurgly noise, but it wound up being a totally, he'll tell you, Rihanna will tell you what it was, but totally different issue. Yeah. Which I had never heard of. Oh yeah. I've learned a lot of uh, words in, <laughs> through this experience that I'd never heard of before. Um, but uh, yeah, so we think we just decide, well, we're going to pack him up. Luckily I had that frame pack that's meant to pack me. And so I stuck him in there just like an elk quarter between the pack and the frame. 83 pounds. And uh, zipped, zipped him up or uh, strapped him down. Did you tuck his legs in? Yeah. He okay. was he, so was he like, wasn't dangling? Yeah, he was sitting side. He was sitting 90 degrees to my back. And I thought, I was like, if he's, you know, I didn't think he was going to, I didn't think the dog was going to be alive. And I'm like, especially he's not going to be alive now. Right. And we after. even talked about what are you going to do though? It's like, there's nothing you can do. No. There's, there's no way to, we're on a scree slide. Like, there's no way to do anything. You know, you're not going to call no. a helicopter. No. It's like, you have to just, you couldn't, a sled would have been no good. And there's nothing you can do. And there's, honestly, even having more people wouldn't have really no, helped. No, there's like nothing you can do. You can't tag, a, you can't tag team it. A sled wouldn't do you any good. Yeah. You can't go up. There's just, there's nothing to do. But yeah. I was like, because it was breathing bad, I didn't, you know, you guys, you're like, keep your airways open. And like, oh, slump them in the back of a backpack and make, right. a, run, well, make like, a run for it. The, the human response, right, would be like, you uh, provide stability for this victim so the movement doesn't cause more trauma. Exactly. Right, yeah. or exacerbate whatever internal injuries you can't see, which is just not an option in this scenario because it's a ticking clock. And that dog was cold too. Oh. That was the other thing I thought about waiting. He's already all wet and shivering. Yeah. And know. he got a lot colder uh, throughout the day because it took a while. So uh, I decided to, instead of going back up the way we came, which in retrospect, I still haven't decided if that would have been faster or not. What do you think? Yeah. It took me a long time it to go out the faster. creek. It was like an it was like a mile and a quarter, mile and a half as the crow flew. I figured it might have been two miles the route we took to get out the creek and it would have been better to go with me because we had all the time in the world waiting on me yeah. Yeah. The kids made a second fire and yeah 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 but you didn't have to climb that hill with 85 pounds on your back no but i still think it would have been quicker all right well so i but i made this the decision which i often say don't do if you already know one route and it was the thing was is all those logs i didn't no. feel like climbing over all those logs on the way back up with a full pack was going to be fun anyways it takes me two hours to pack him out. We meet up with the crew, load him in back into the dog. Well, he sled. comes when he comes finally busting <laughs> out of the brush. The dog's not in the backpack anymore. That's right. He had he's right- carrying that dog <laughs> like a like like on the front of a romance novel. Well, right at the right like <laughs> seconds before that, he had just started s- legs and stuff started slipping out of the pack and. He was getting a little floppy on me. And so I had him on the ground and I'm like, I can, I know where you guys are. Yeah. Just, you know, 200 yards away. And I'm like, eh, at this point, Got it. I'll just, you know, he man it, which was probably a bad idea. Oh, dude, like, I couldn't believe it. Because when, you come like out, this, when I went to take hard. him out of your hands, I couldn't get him. I couldn't hold him standing there barely. <laughs> so it's a he, hard, awkward package. That's a big, heavy dog. Was he making any noise over the course of this? He, he looked somehow better. Like a little more with it, maybe. I don't know. Maybe the concussion was wearing off. I'm guessing that could have been. No. He was, uh, the whole time I could hear him breathing, but it was very shallow breathing, but just this, you know, but just shallow breathing. Mm-hmm. I but told at least my, I could hear him breathing, which was good. I told my older boy, I said, I took him aside and I said, I don't think that Mangus is going to come out alive out of the woods. 
and I can hear my daughter, like she's like acting like she's a vet. And somehow she got, and she's telling Yanni's daughters that if it's got a broken leg, they're going to have to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I was, like, I was like, Jimmy tells me this. I should say, I didn't, I didn't hear her say it. Jimmy said, he's she's tattletailing that Rosemary is really upsetting Ina and Mabel with her like armchair vet <laughs> talk. Which oh. in this particular instance, you're like, well. Uh, How old are they? Well, Rosemary's 11. Yep. Ina and Mabel are 10 and 12. Yeah. And then my older boy's 13 and my younger boy's yeah. nine. Well, there's vet shows all over the internet and uh, oh. television these days that the kids watch. And so I think I she's think mixing up the... horses because I told yeah, her it's yeah. hard to fix a horse's yeah. leg. Uh, I think yeah, she's mixing yeah, that, that all could up. could be. <laughs> um, Anyhow, a lot of like coaching. Yeah, the us. only time he made any noise is one time I had like slipped down a little bit of a bank and uh, kind of caught myself, caught my own weight, and that caused him to you know shift pretty heavily to one side, mm-hmm. and he made like a little moany groan kind of a sound but other than that he was good so are you, are you talking to your buddy the whole way out oh yeah yeah, yeah just mm-hmm. apologizing pretty much you know yeah shedding some tears yeah. it was sad oh you know? it was terrible oh. it's terrible um every now and then for whatever reason he would like rotate 90 degrees and then get a paw on each one of my shoulders oh. and, like, and kind of like even put his chin on my one shoulder and i was like oh my gosh God, anyway, kill me now Why'd yeah you do this to yeah me? but then he'd like He'd go the other way and he'd almost like his head would like get too far back and kind of get floppy and I'd have to look to make sure he yeah. was still with yeah, me, you know? Exactly. Oh man, I felt terrible for you guys that day. But uh yeah, we could get him loaded up. Ina comes with me. Steve still had to go and uh had some unfinished business on that trail. Mm-hmm. Um and so just Ina and I took Mingus in and uh, there's only one place to get emergency vet services uh here in the greater Bozeman area. So we went there and um, try, try, trying to make it a little, little bit faster here. But uh, we spent a couple hours in there as they're checking him out. He's obviously, he was very cold. They had to bring his core temp back up. Uh, the, the shallow breathing, uh, the injury was called pneumothorax, uh, which basically is air inside of, you know, your chest that's between your chest lining and your lungs. And so when you have air in there, it prevents the lungs from actually expanding and doing what they're supposed to do. Hence the crazy noise. Yeah, and the super shallow breathing. Um, So they basically just stick like, I I don't know if this is exactly right, but it's like a syringe that's meant for pulling air out. So they They just- vent you, yeah. Yeah, they vent them. And I think after they do it three or four times, they'll actually just stick like a tube in there Mm -hmm. and just constantly keep pulling it. But it took them- they said on the fourth time they would go to the tube. They only did it three times. They pulled like two liters of air out of there, and that was kind of the end of that. Hmm. Um, all Did- those lacerations, he had, I don't know, 30, 40 some stitches and staples kind of all over. Um, they shaved any part where there was any trauma on that dog. Uh, when he when he came home- <laughs> Looked like a mole rat. Mole. <laughs> when he came home, half of him was shaved. Like his rear end- because, yeah, you just start to, you know, because you're fixated on different things of what's going on with the dog. And so it takes a day or two and you start paying closer attention. But his rear end was, the whole thing was just purple mm. for oh. a week, yeah, yeah. you know, from the impact. Uh, did did they give you the talk, like, before any of this happened? Were they kind of like, um, no, here's your options and no. how much are you willing to spend? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That one for sure. Like you knew very quickly what it was going to take. And so I had to have that conversation with my gal. And, and uh, yeah, I, I feel like I owe a lot of people an apology because I for sure have sort of poked fun at anybody that spent, I always said of course. five K is my limit. And I was like, you did what? Your dog got ACL <laughs> surgery, you dumbass, you know? That's that was one of the first things I mentioned to you after we knew the dog would be all right. I was like, if someone had taken you aside a month ago and said, how much would you put into that dog in vet care before you pulled the plug and got a new one? And you'd be, you know, you'd think about it, like, hey, four or five grand, I suppose, you know, whatever. I don't know what the yeah. number would be, but you'd, you'd have some number. But then you get in the actual situation and there's like, this leads to that. And you got to bring it down and then find out what's going on. And then there's all this emotional stuff and you're, the, the daughters are involved and, and you can just see how it runs away with itself. Totally. 
Oh yeah. You know, it, it's not like um, you know, it's not like you get up there and someone says, "Okay, now's your decision moment." You know, is is, is this worth 10k or not worth 10k? You know, but it's, it's like I don't know. It's maybe like, do you want another? Well, spend I don't another know. Maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be dead. Maybe yeah. it's three hundred dollars. <laughs> but I just you know you can't. You just go and then it, it snowballs and and then there you are with the massive vet. Bill. Oh, dude, <laughs> they, when, well, they uh, were pretty <laughs> spot on with w- once they kind of had him stabilized and and had and, and they knew what was going yeah. on. So basically, the only he had a mild concussion. They gave him some drugs and he popped right out of that. He had the pneumothorax. They pumped that out. They gave him whatever, 30, 40 stitches and staples all over. Not a big deal. Uh, the one broken bone from falling 40 feet, basically straight to rock. Was it the leg I thought was broke or not the leg I thought was broke? Uh, one of his, his left rear leg no, has, has a uh, fractured patella. So he broke his kneecap. Mm. That's so nuts. Um, and uh, But anyways, yeah, so... Once they had him stabilized, they were able to call us and be like, this is what it's going to cost. Oh, yeah. By that point, you already carried him all that way and all that. It's just different. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> then you're like, okay, well, uh, what's it going to cost? Are you going to just put him to sleep? And then I'm going to either lie to my daughters that he didn't make <laughs> yeah. it through the night. Girls, or... I, told, I told the vet, money is no object. <laughs> <laughs> Drain right. their but college it died. funds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like he would have... Like the put into sleep thing, if they had just stopped care, he wouldn't have just like died on his own. You know what I mean? No. Like he, how could you yeah, not, it's not like a, at that? It's do like, not resuscitate. It's yeah. like they'd actively have to put him down, which yeah. isn't free. Well, no. Yeah, I mean, you either. can't have a no. dog run around with a broken, I don't know, maybe. No, I asked about that and they said basically the leg would just atrophy to nothing and then you end up having to amputate it and it wouldn't be a good deal. And I told you my theory about three-legged dogs. <laughs> oh, listen, I was ready to go there. I need to check up on this because they told me that it was pretty much going to be the same price to go to a three-legged dog to what we 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 paid for. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's a bargain because people like them three-legged dogs, yeah. man. Yeah. I, look, I, I would have had no problem running a three-legged hound. You're I like know a, a couple of oh, them. Oh, they'd have made a Yeti yeah. film about you. Yeah. If you started yeah. catching, <laughs> if you started catching lions with a three-legged dog, they'd have made a whole Yeti movie. There'd be, yeah, like totally. the, there'd be like the sad part with the yeah. sad music and yeah. Oh, You're like, what if you to... took them both off and we got one of those wheelie carts? How much that 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 <laughs> off road <laughs> mountain bike tires on the back? Um, before we <laughs> couldn't leave, take them in wilderness though. Before we <laughs> leave right. the vet the first night, <laughs> that got filled. They're like, everything's kind of set. He's stabilized. We're like, all right, we'll get a phone call from you later. To and they're like, yeah, surgery probably tomorrow or go home and discuss with your you mm-hmm. know family on you know if you guys want to pay etc. But they're like, oh, you want to come back real quick and just say you know give him a kiss and and say bye and check him out. I'm like, yeah, sure, that sounds like a great idea. You know why not? I wasn't thinking like goodbye as in forever, but just like go you know give him a pat on the back. And we walk in there and it's just him laying on this table. I mean, there's people kind of milling out and about. Did you have your girls? Just just Ina. And we walk over there, and when we're like maybe five feet from the table, you kind of, you're like, oh, you see the big blanket, and he's got the little mask on, you know, helping him. So he's like not looking great, shaved everywhere. And uh, you're kind of like, you know, your heart sinks a little bit to see your buddy in in such a bad state, because he's not really like, he doesn't even look up at you when you walk in there. And right as we're like getting to be a little bit closer, where we're going to like put our hands on him, the machine next to him goes... Deep, deep, deep. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's a dude running over, and he's like, Dr. So-and-so, I need seven milligrams of this. No, make a tent and prepare a backup. And all of a sudden, it's like, <laughs> there's five people around him, and we're like pushed out. And I mean, it's like an ER scene. You know, like, you Did they have the little paddles? Clear. Yeah, it was getting, it was going to be that <laughs> oh soon. God. And Ina looks at me like, what the F? They just told us he was stable. You know, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, his... Uh, he had had just like a little heart arrhythmia, and uh, well, and you it was, and him got the same problem. It was all, <laughs> yeah. His is gone away, I think, but it was just caused from that impact mm-hmm. and uh, the trauma to the heart. You know, that's what caused that pneumothorax too. Was just such impact that some part of the lung, whether it's like a, a burst of sac or an alveoli, but some end part of the lobe just goes Poof, and like pops open and literally releases air into your chest. Oh. You can have internal, which is pneumothorax, which is what he had, or you can have external pneumothorax, which is if your, you know, rib cage actually got punctured and air got in that way. 
You know what I'm learning about myself right now? If you were telling me that about a person, I'd be having all these problems. <laughs> but because it's a dog, I'm not having all these problems. Like if someone tells me, oh, yeah, I got testicular cancer, my nuts start aching. <laughs> but like I can hear all this. You... I can hear all this without having the, 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 the pain. You feel like a pain or just like a strange sensation? No, I feel like, man, I got that problem too. It's like a sympathetic <laughs> pregnancy Steve gets, you yeah. know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm just noticing that for some reason, if you were explaining that in that kind of graphic you're not, detail, you're not I'd feel like my lungs, lungs crackling. I feel like my lungs, I'd be like, there's something wrong. <laughs> I'm short of breath. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he's, he, they put a, uh, what's called an external fixator around his rear leg, which is basically oh. this bracket that mm -hmm. has pins that all go into different bones that are holding things together. And now the external fixator actually has a piston looks just like the piston, um, on the, uh, hatch on your topper you know, that, <laughs> that holds your, uh, your window open. And then they adjust it. And and give him more range of motion. What? When he's we done weekly. with that, can I have the piston? Because I've been using a broom <laughs> to top up my windshield for months now. You know, I think luckily they don't. They take it back, and so that saves you a little bit of money. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I won't own that piece of hardware when it's, when we're all done. Yeah, you here. take a bid from them, and yeah, just Randall. compare yeah. with my uh, the the shop down there. Yeah. You know, how did how did parts. you how did you carry him out on the snowmobile? We have a sled. Like a dog box that sits on a sled okay. that's like a trailer behind the snowmobile. Okay. So we just loaded him right into his box and he wrapped him up in his down jacket. Yeah. Try to make try to warm him up a little bit. So if anyone wants to send Yanni a bunch of money, that's what he'll do with his <laughs> <laughs> He'll turn around and give it to his vet. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a big it's a big number. Uh do we, they do you do you get a payment plan? Like how are you supposed to come up with that kind of money? Yeah, they actually have a uh there's like a emergency vet credit that you can get for with super low uh with super low interest from who? It's it's it, that's what they're Through the vet. Well, it, I mean, they advertise It's like they, a third party yeah, financing option. God. It's like the guy sits there with a desk up for and that. Suit, yeah, he's writes it writes it up while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go ask my manager. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a great it's a great yeah. business plan because you're just sitting around like, who should I lend money to? Who's going to spend the money no matter what? Yeah, totally. So the vet honest. offers like financing, or it's a third party. It's a third party. It's like yeah. Cordova, you know, like on yeah. I was looking at it the other day when I paid a big vet bill. Just wonder if I could do it in like six. So months. now you got to make payments. You know, I don't know if we have it uh, figured out exactly how we're going to do it. We'll probably just take a you know big chunk out of savings and just knock it out. You know, Ugh, man, better that. Than now you can resent that, that dog every time you see him. Well, you know, it's funny because that dog is a you know pound puppy, shelter dog, whatever you want to call him. Oh, he, so now you can just act like you bought him for a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was like a hundred, because pound dogs aren't free. They still make you pay for uh, neutering $75. and shots and shit. Yeah, yeah. it's like 7500 So now you paid 10000 now you, you just really boosted his pedigree there. <laughs> yeah, totally. I better get his papers now. When people ask Yanni how yeah. much you pay for that dog, he had to start the story by going, well, he's a, he's a genuine racehorse now. Just like... <laughs> So yeah, he's fine now. He's uh he, he's he's going he's not going stir crazy. You think he would be? I mean, he wants to go out. He can't. You can't just let him roam. He's basically got to be on a leash. It was a season ender. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, there's no no more cat hunting here. And Yanni lost his appetite for cat hunting. He he doesn't like doing it without his own dog. He said. Mm. Oh yeah. I mean, come he on. went he went with someone else's dog. He said it wasn't the same. Yeah, yeah. it was still fun. Yeah. Just not the same. Right. But, he yeah. didn't jump off a cliff. That's You're why. Not, yeah. <laughs> In the game. So yeah. what? Uh, I was amazed at this when we were chatting on on text. They said it was like ninety five percent recovery to like to full full mm. recovery for that back leg. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So it won't be like new, but I think I mean he'll be able to hunt no problem. How old is the I'll dog? Take four. Okay. Yeah, I'll take him right. He's back got another there. at least you know four to six. Yeah. I would think. I'll say I'd get him right back to that same spot. See if he learned anything. Shock the shit out of him with the collar. He'd <laughs> be like, no, no. No cliff bands. Yeah, it's not, the, no, not a bad idea to put him up on top of the cliff and then shock him. You know, right. You know, what You'll find that he never goes left ever again. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, only, only turns dog that only goes right. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see if he does have any, uh, <clears throat> you know, post, you know, trauma, you know, from it. 
Like, did he learn from it? If he remembers it. As hard headed as that dog is, I don't think so. No. I doubt it. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for being there and helping out. It would have been uh, even tougher if it had just been me and my girls. Yeah. I don't want to say it was fun, but I'm glad it worked out the way it did because, like I said, I felt terrible for you guys. Yeah. It was. uh, It's mostly felt terrible for your girls because that would have been a hard little trip. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the uh, one other sort of uh, silver lining out of this is I, I wasn't even really bringing it up, but uh, and because I, I don't know if it was Jennifer that was like seeing like how bummed out I was about how the season ended for us and how like it was you know no more lion hunting for me and Mingus, you know it's we're done for till next year, but uh, she pretty much has given the go ahead for number two. Mm. So Mingus goes like, off know, another one you know, next babe, year. It wouldn't be so bad if I had a second dog. <laughs> I'd still be in the race. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah. Get oh. a- August. I think we'll have a puppy. Oh, that's mm. awesome, man. Yep. All right, Dan, you ready to dive in? I've been doing this for the last five months. I'm, yeah. It's all you've been doing is diving. <laughs> That's in. A, you, yeah. you already dove. <laughs> yeah, I dove. I fell off a cliff. So they found me. I was gurgling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lay out who you uh, lay out your organization first, and then lay out, uh, and then just kind of give the give the rundown of what when I said what's going on in Colorado. What tell us what's up with Colorado. But first, tell, give a thorough inter- introduction of yourself. So I'm Dan Gates. I'm the executive director for the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. And it's a 501c4 organization. Uh, our mission is to enhance, promote, and defend the North American model of wildlife conservation and responsible wildlife management. And so we're not a we're not a membership organization, uh, but we do advocacy work and education work on a variety of different levels. And we have three full time lobbyists at the Colorado Capitol. And we fight through the legislative side of things and the regulatory side through the Parks and Wildlife Commission. And now we've been dealt um, a citizen's initiative to uh, bring it to a ballot for November 5th of this year to ban the harvest of mountain lions, bobcats, and the red herring on that is lynx. I heard you talk about that before, but I mean, lynx aren't harvestable in the lower 48, but they want to make sure that they never are. If they're ever delisted, they say, no, we 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 don't want you to ever do it if they ever become delisted. Dan, when you say a citizen's initiative, can you say where like that's... Like, where did it come from? I, I want to uh, clarify just real quick, though. You, too. Bet. You, you said you've been dealt this. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is an issue that Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management is fighting against. Fighting against. Yes. Yeah. We, we, we beat similar type issues through the Parks and Wildlife Commission. And they also, the, the antis, the extremists, went to the General Assembly the, through the legislature in 2022, and we beat them there. And this was their other option to turn around and, and, and file an initiative, which 26 states have that available to them, but file an initiative to where they get enough signatures through the legal process, and then they can put it on the ballot for people to vote on right? in, in, in an attempt to, to ban. I mean, they call it trophy hunting, even though we went through the proper steps that were allowed to us through the Secretary of State and the title board and the Supreme Court, that we got trophy hunting out of the title, but it still remains in the measure itself. Hmm. But it's not trophy hunting. It's it's a, it's a hunting ban. Yeah. It's a, a mountain lion and bobcat hunting ban is what it is. Yeah, you don't fill out a questionnaire asking what you're interested in retaining from the animal, and then you get to get a permit if you write the right thing down. No, no. It's, it's you know, the, the intent is, their definition of trophy hunting, Steve, is intentionally killing, wounding, stalking, and trapping a bobcat or a mountain lion. And intentionally killing is not trophy hunting. That's It's hunting. And and the the scary part about this is that and we appreciate the opportunity to continually talk about it, but it's an education process because it it'll become statutory. I mean, it'll set a precedent. Well, I, I, I want you to back up a little bit because I want to yeah. get to this yeah. the language part of this in a minute. But uh, how many signatures? Like like tell how a ballot initiative works. So they file they file and and it has to go through the proper legal processes as in any state. Mm-hmm. There's 26 states that allow it, but they file and then there's an opportunity for arguments from the they're the proponents, we're the opposers. I was the only objector on the entire uh, legal documents through the state. Because when you of say arguments. they like 
who is they so is the, what I was getting so at. The, the organization that that is doing it is is a group called cats aren't trophies it's it's called cats was it built for this purpose it was built specifically for this pur- purpose yeah. I see, yeah and but but they have deep connections with the Animal Welfare Action Institute for a Humane Economy, which is run by Wayne Pacelli, the former HSUS executive director, mm-hmm. and uh, Wild Earth Guardians, and a, a variety. And if you look at their website, there's 50 or 60 different organizations that are all on board, but it's Cats Aren't Trophies is the organization. Is Center for Biological Diversity on it? Uh, they're, they're on it as far as a supporter yeah. But to the best of our knowledge, they haven't put any money in that's been trackable. Sierra Club didn't get in on it, did they? Everybody has. They're yeah. on it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you 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 look at the you look at the they're, line. They're listed item. as a supporter. Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 gotten to a point to where I think they see it as a shiny object, and they're willing to turn around and throw their name into the hat on every single thing. Uh, and the individual people that are running the Colorado side of of those organizations. Have have been those are the ones that we've been fighting for the last twenty years anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's a, but they just keep resurfacing. I mean, it's like mushrooms. You get rid of them out of your yard, but they're, they're pretty soon they show up somewhere else. It's so weird too, because bobcats are an IUCN species of least concern. Yeah, yeah. There's, which is so surprising that Center for Biological Diversity and Sierra Club and organizations like that would even be in it when you're talking about a species of least concern. And that's a great point too when we talk about like they. Uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature is like the they when people are like, well, they say it's okay mm-hmm. or they say they're doing good. It's it's the the uh, convention that people go to to see how everything's doing. It's yeah. like the, the the science at the back end of um, all biological diversity, basically. And when I'm saying species of least concern, they rank out. If you're curious about any animal, you, you can go look up the IUCN status, any species, and, and, and it, it factors in foreseeable issues, right? So mm-hmm. you could have stable populations of an animal, but they'll look and they'll be like, well, foreseeable issues coming up, and that'll impact the level. But if you go look up a bobcat, bobcat's species of least concern, meaning stable, widespread, no foreseeable issues. Exactly. And same with mountain lions. Yeah. I mean, you know, mountain lions, mountain lions and bobcats are so highly regulated in the United States that people, you know, it's the fallacies, the lies, and the falsehoods of our enemies. If you say it enough, people start to believe it. And the facts and the data will argue those those um, points that the opposition brings. But Bobcats and mountain lions, there's, there's no, we all know this sitting around the table, but the general public for the most part doesn't. No, and the lynx you know. thing is funny because the lynx are, or enjoy the highest level of protection that any animal can get in America because mm-hmm. they're ESA protected. Exactly. Exactly. They're, they're harvestable in Canada and Alaska, but not down in the lower the entire, 48. Their entire lower, lower 48, they're endangered species yeah. that are protected. Yeah. But it, they're, they're, so using a, state that. Can't, a state can't do anything anyway. No. It's just like, half the wolves that you turn around and deal with what we what we have to deal with in Colorado wolves are not uh on the endangered species list in in the northern Rockies but they're going to be in Colorado just because we brought them there but it's the same wolves that came from Oregon that probably came from somewhere else that it's it's the lies that that our opposition wants to be able to bring to the table and they like I say if they say it enough it just becomes the truth as far as they're concerned and what we're trying to do is make sure that the general public, not just in Colorado, I mean, we have to worry about the voter, but throughout the United States, sportsmen and women need to pay attention because of the way it's written. And you could turn around and put it in Arkansas or Wisconsin or yeah. or anything, and just change change their statutes because of the statutory component of this, you know, with people voting on it. Did uh, how many votes does it take, or how many signatures? And then what's the population of Colorado and how many signatures? So, do you need? so it's roughly 2% of the population that they need for signatures, but I think it's 124,238 signatures that they have to get that are certified. Yeah. So they're out gathering signatures now, but the, we're, we're assuming that they'll probably have to get 180,000 because there'll be some ineligible ones and some ones that aren't, you know, readable or yeah, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. People won't fill it fill it out right. So that one won't they might fill out the wrong county or they might fill out that it's a country, not a county. Hanging uh, Chads. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, See, you know, our, our young friend yeah, here, he doesn't say. he doesn't get the hanging chads joke. <laughs> no. And you're lucky. Gore v. Bush. Yeah. yeah. If you ever go if ever when they get to Gore v. Bush in history, listen, you'll hear about hanging chads. Yeah. Uh but Colorado uh it, 
in the state constitution, they have to uh, pass these citizens' initiatives if if the populace votes yay, right? Well, this will not be constitutional. This will be statutory. So a constitutional one, would you would have to get 2% of those required signatures from each one of the 35 Senate districts. So this oh. one here, they could all stand out in front of one Whole Foods in downtown Den- Denver, essentially. And, <laughs> that's and, what, I, that's yeah. what I'll say, too. I always think of that because there's, like, you can't go to a Whole Foods without someone having a picnic table, oh, yeah. a folding <laughs> table out front oh, collecting yeah. signatures yeah. for something. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 there's, we had some guys downtown Denver that were doing some other functions, and they said there was, at one location, there was five individuals that were out gathering signatures for five different ballot initiatives at one spot. I mean, I don't know what you do, but if I, I don't go to the grocery store, my wife does, but if I went there and there was five people trying to hit me up on the way in or the way out, I mean, I'll buy Gr- Girl Scout cookies if I go, but I'm not going to turn around and stop and sign five petitions. No, I'm always I'm always thinking, my just the fact that you're here makes me suspicious of what you're getting signatures exactly. for. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. What do you want to change in my life? Okay. You know, that's, I that's uh, lo- love is. the produce. <laughs> But I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this parking lot. <laughs> well, and there's 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 so many things going on in Colorado because of the landscape that we've got. Um, I mean, the gubernatorial administration has not been favorable to us, to say the least, when it comes to to, to hunting and fishing and agriculture type issues. And there's some other stuff going on in Denver that the state won't be able to vote on, but the Denver city and county residents will. And one is a fur ban which is not a fur ban. It's it, it's much broader than that. And it's a slaughterhouse ban as well. Both of those are citizen ballot initiatives for Denver City County residents. But those are the same people that will be able to vote on the statewide mountain lion and bobcat issue as well. So they get to vote on three things to try to take away. And the state residents themselves get to vote on the mountain lion and bobcat, but they can't engage in the other ones because they don't live in the city. <laughs> You're just looking at me like, uh, let's go talk about remember, lions. Listen, I, no, 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 no I'm, I'm, that's, I'm not looking at you that way. I just remember back in, uh, I remember back in the early nineties, must've been the nineties when Colorado had the, yep. had a bear, bear initiative. No, the one they had the trapping ban. Well, that was in 96. And I remember, I'm looking at you that way only because of this. I remember that trapping ban, someone said at the time, the minute Denver and Fort Collins had a population that equaled the broader population of Colorado. Mm-hmm. Meaning, fifty point one percent of Coloradans lived in Denver, Fort Collins. The trapping ban. Yep, ninety two was the. And they were like, the man, it was, was like it was like urban people v. Yep, rural people. Mm-hmm. And and I saw a statistic that, and this is pretty much across the board, especially in the West. In nineteen hundred, eighty percent of the population lived on the landscape, and twenty percent lived in the city or the municipalities. In 1950, it was a 50-50 mix. And in 2000, 20% lived on the landscape and 80% lived in the cities. I mean, just in 100 years. In the next 50 years, they're saying that it'll probably be somewhere around 90% live in the cities and 10% will live on the landscape. That's the problem that we get into because everybody benefits off of hunting and fishing, even if they don't participate in it. They benefit off of agriculture production. I mean, they ha- we all have to eat. It's not like we're all growing chickens and gardens in everybody's backyard. But all of that stuff plays into people's psyche because it doesn't affect them until they go to the grocery store or until they want to, you know, feed their kids or go to McDonald's or something. And uh, I think that we're getting to a point where there's going to be some break even where people are just going to get fed up and say, wait a minute, let's, let's just leave it up to the experts, you know, on, on a variety of different things. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to this November, I think, just because of the outreach that we've gotten and the, and the momentum that we're actually building on this issue. Cause people are sick and tired of extremism. They're sick and tired of somebody telling them what to do, whether whether they do it or not. It's the fact that they might want to do it, or they know that their uncle does it, or their brother does it, or the guy that works at Whole Foods does it while somebody's trying to gather signatures outside. That that was a point I wanted to get into with this, which makes it tricky. Is uh, you look at um, you look at certain environmental battles. Uh, the, the in, environmental fights that sportsmen get involved in, okay? And the, the most noto- notable example would be like the huge outpouring of um, that came from the hunting and fishing community all around the country in opposition to um, developing the Pebble Mine site, okay? Mm-hmm. And a lot of, like, people wanted to draw a line in the sand on the, the Pebble Mine development, even if they weren't 
planning to go to Bristol Bay, right? They looked and they're like that, you know, just, it was easy for people to picture like, that's the wrong mind in the wrong place. I'll never go there, but I recognize this is something I want to lean in on. The problem when it comes to method of take fights or, or fights like this, I think it's hard for people to picture why it matters to them. Like, you know, I don't hunt bobcats. I don't, uh, hunt mountain lions. I don't have any friends that run mm-hmm. lions. Why would I care? Right? Because it, it's hard, it, it just winds up being harder to imagine why it. Why well, you can fight. extrapolate pebble as a just a total clean water issue, mm-hmm. right? Sure. And yeah. clean water, the the overlap for the general population, the bell curve of the population, mm-hmm. it strikes a bigger tone. And so, like, what uh, what's our messaging? Right. When we say, well, this method of take, this particular species, what what's the overlap for the the bell curve of the biggest po- possible chunk of the population, right? That's that's the the messaging that that we have to um be able to get to with with a lot of non hunters. Yeah, and I think that what what if I look at I'm I'd worry about I got a handful of balls in the air here and I'm going to turn it back over to you in a minute, but I just want to clarify a point. Like even just, if it just, if this, if a vote like this breaks on hunters, non hunters, you're going to lose because most yeah. people aren't hunters. Right. I don't know what, what's participation rate in Colorado, 14 high at, at the high end. If at that, the high end. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to lose anyway. So it's like hunters and then some supporters. Now, if we were talking about a deer and elk hunting ban, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility in my kid's lifetime. No. So if you're talking about a deer and elk hunting ban, you're going to buck it up. You're pretty much bucketing up most hunters. Okay. Most hunters are going to be like, that impacts me. If you talk about an obscure game animal, Mm -hmm. you're not even bucketing up most hunters. But even if you had all hunters, you still need extra support from elsewhere. Exactly. Right. So I wonder about how to gather it up and i would say like for starters and i'll I'll leave it to you on the public end of things the non-hunter end of things i would argue with hunters why you need to pay attention to this is again you're talking about taking a stable expanding population of wildlife and and if if we if we say and i don't i don't i don't i'm not terribly familiar with the iucn but an international board of biologists determines these things to be stable with no foreseeable threat. The and experts that the experts lean on. And you're saying, no, we're pulling that species out of the pool of available resources, not because they're imperiled, not because they're endangered, not because there's any reason to think that these species have a chance of extirpation, but just because we don't think you should go and get those. Exactly. So what's next? Um, Sorry, guys. Jeremy Romero, I was making one of his recipes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Berea tacos. Oh. So. So hip. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We learned that in trivia <laughs> a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Point being, um, that's what I would say to hunters, why this matters to you. Because, like, stuff you like to do is in line. Mm-hmm. Bears, that's definitely coming, Right. Someone could go make the case on bighorn sheep. That they're trying. Yeah, whatever. I mean, you know. all, other stuff is coming. This is just like a step Archery. along the way. Archery. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Archery. That's mean. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, how do you think the, the like? How should the 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 non hunting public? Why do they care? Well, the 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 hardest thing to get people to understand is why something affects benefits or, or adversely affects them. And, and for somebody that doesn't hunt, they have to recognize, we have to get them to recognize the importance of hunting and conservation. And, and the problem I think that we get into with that messaging is you got 10% that are going to be strong, you know, right hunters. And you got 10% that are going to be strong, right extremists. You know, I, I don't like the word animal activists because they're not, they're terrorists, they're extremists. You know, they, they might be activists as well, but I mean, their mentality is to disrupt the entire process of every game agency in the country and on the continent as extremists. I mean, they, they want to do it 
at the, at the extremest level that they possibly can. You mentioned bighorn sheep. Uh, Tris Zornio, and I've mentioned this, I think, even on the live show that we did. Tris Zornio, uh, with the Denver, uh, the Colorado Sun, mentioned why are we why are we harvesting bighorn sheep, our state animal? Bighorn sheep are no different than mountain lions. They're already setting the tone and the narrative mm -hmm. of why we shouldn't do something and and why why they should be able to go after the low hanging fruit like on bobcats and mountain lions. There's less bobcat and mountain lion harvesters out there than there is m many other things. But there's less bighorn sheep, less mountain goat, and less moose harvesters than there is the mountain lion and bobcat combined. Huh. And you can't, I mean, so you stop and think of that. You know, I mean, we sold 2,500 mountain that, lions. That's pretty interesting. I hadn't thought yeah, of that, man. The, the, uh, we sold 2,500 mountain lions last year, license last year. We had a, a success rate of 19%. On, on bobcats, we can only cage trap in the state of Colorado, or we can use hounds, or we can hunt them with predator calls. But roughly about... About eight thousand guys participate in some capacity to to pursue mountain lions. Or, excuse me, bobcats. This year we harvested around nine hundred bobcats. On some years it's been as high as nineteen hundred that you had guys out there. But in the his, historical side of things, we we did thirty six, thirty eight hundred bobcats back in the seventies. When and prices the 80s, were crazy. When prices were crazy, and you had more people out there doing it. You know, trucks cost twelve grand, and and bobcats were four hundred dollars, and now trucks are eighty grand, and guy's got fourteen kids, and you know he's got vet bills with his dogs and all the other stuff. I mean, he he's not out pursuing like what they used to, but that doesn't mean that it's not a viable option or an advocation for management. But it's interesting the harvest is down historically down. Yeah, it just has a market factor. Well, on the bobcats anyway, but yeah. but back in. In 1965, when, when mountain lions became a big game animal, before that they were a nuisance in Colorado, we roughly had 200 mountain lions on the landscape, and now we boast 5,000 with regulated hunting, with regulated harvest, with objectives that are met throughout the entire state. We've got more lions now than what we've ever had, and they still want us not to be able to harvest them because it's wrong. That's what they say. They don't care that it has anything to do with management. I think that's where the general public says, why is it wrong? How should it be worked? Why should you just take it out? They're starting to ask those questions. I mean, as, ma as, as many opportunities we've had to talk to the general public at a variety of different levels, and I'm not speaking for all 5.9 million people in Colorado, but people are questioning why. Why isn't our game agency, our, our scientists and our biologists good enough to make the decisions on our game management practices? And they're starting to realize. And I think, honestly, guys, I think the, the wolf issue brought that to the forefront because it was a 51 to 49% vote, very, very split decision. Uh, we were told that we would lose by, by you know, something like 60, 68 to 32%, and it was 51 to 49. I think it surprised the hell out of everybody on both sides because even the people that thought, well, maybe this would kind of be cool, but I'm not really sure. And then the other ones that thought, yeah, I'd like to hear a wolf howl. Now that it's been in the news for the last four years, they're like, well, there has been a lot of negativity. Do we really want to go the route of bob bobcats and mountain lions? The general public starting to question why we can't rely on our experts, our scientists. We've heard the science, heard the science all the way through COVID, and through that whole process. Why can't we follow the science here? And I think that that's starting to play a significant role in people's psyches about. Well, I like to know that bobcats and mountain lions are appropriately managed because they've been talking about wolves being appropriately managed now for the last four years. Why do we need to turn around and put it on the ballot? What was the lion harvest in Colorado the last year? Uh, roughly like. Just less than 500, like 486 that was actually by hunters. Yeah. I don't know if this wind up, uh, I don't know how this impa impactful this will be to voters, but you, you see an interesting thing happen where the states do depredation work. Yep. Uh, I've never checked into this exhaustively, but my understanding is before California had their lion hunting ban, hunters in California were killing about 300 lions a year. Um. Since then, the state is killing about 300 lions a year. Somewhere in that neck of the woods, I've seen high and lows of that. Okay. But, but, the, but the, the kicker, trying to explain it to our public, is that hunters aren't paying to do that. Taxpayers are paying government officials, whether federal or otherwise. Oh, to yeah. You to used that. to have people pay. Mm -hmm. You said yeah. people pay for the opportunity. Yeah. And now you're taking taxpayer money to pay someone to do it mm -hmm. as though, and it's so, as though the lion that's getting shot is like, well, thank God it's a government employee. 
they're happy about it now yeah. because they're, they're, they got a government employee got me and not a guy and not a guy who was paying into the uncle. system. Well, and that's where like a major like fallacy or, or lie about the whole story is is that they're telling people that hey, if we stop this, the end result is that there's less lions killed, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you're getting pitched this at Whole Foods and getting they're get, trying to get your signature, they're going to tell you we're going to stop the killing of mountain lions. You probably, but, I mean, you'll you'll dent it for sure. I, well, maybe in the I short mean, term. The, yeah. This part, though, like, I don't think that's what's effective, right? Like, we can look at, there's a big-ass uh, billboard on on the uh, Bozeman Hill here, mm-hmm. uh, driving west out of Yellowstone. Uh, Sal Grizzly Bear has a couple of cubs, <laughs> big old bullseye drawn on, on mom's back, yeah. and it says- uh, <laughs> Which would be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> right? And like hunters look at it and you're like, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Right? But it's like uh, delisting, state management means trophy hunting, and, and it's the crosshair on the sow's back, which everybody knows is illegal. No, I'd be like, well, no, because right? you wouldn't be able to shoot a sow with cubs. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's like, that means something to hunters, right? But I think all those arguments should be combined and targeted at outdoor groups and say, okay, here's here's an argument I'm going to make against rock climbing and all rock climbers. Yep. And I'm going to bring this as a citizen's initiative in the state of Colorado to save raptors, right? Rock climbers on this, rock faces. It sounds like we had this discussion because that's, that's the exact same argument that we, that we get on multiple things. You know? I'll, 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 I want to hear about the rock climbers and raptors. <laughs> okay. Well, raptors <laughs> nest. Oh, no, yeah. I'm with you now. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, yeah. We know that rock climbers are killing raptors because they're abandoning their nests because of all these popular routes. Sons of bitches. Yep. They're picking up trash, microplastics. Um, There's no reason that rock climbers should be allowed to do this. They're leaving scars on the rocks, big chalk all over the place. Um, Dirt and myth running all around. <laughs> and, it, and it's killing these poor birds. And you yeah. have the picture of the nest and the little abandoned uh, uh, chicks in there screaming for mom, mm-hmm. you know, who's choking on the six pack ring at the bottom of the the cliff face. All rock climbers are are doing this, right? None of that shit's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, to some degree, it might be, but the but the but the fact of the matter is, if you tell it enough, I mean, you could get people to turn around and buy into oh, it. Oh, absolutely, and especially and, the, and that's the not that big public. of a group of people. No, right? No, but you think they're going to come out in force and go? Wait a minute. <laughs> well, I want to rock climb. Well, I think that the general public would would probably side with the environmental side of it if there wasn't a good argument from the rock climbing community. And there's just not enough rock climbers to get out there and be like, well, and that's why we're at that's why we're at such a deal. You know, I've heard statements from from the specific proponents of these measures that their goal to take the low hanging fruit is, you know, take it then cut the branch, then cut the tree, and then go into the forest. Well, if we're the lowest hanging fruit, the trappers and the mountain lion hunters, mm-hmm. uh, where do you go next? I mean, your point, would it be bear hunting? Would it be archery? Uh, would it be state animal? Would it be, you know, the iconic moose that we introduced there that now de- need to be saved so we can feed those to the wolves? I mean, I don't, I don't know, but it's easily, it's easily distinguishable to see how those lies carry on to the next level because they don't have to pick on these guys anymore because these guys are gone. These guys are out of the picture. I can so, make a great case against mountain biking. Um, <laughs> You're just going to go on the recreation oh, side now. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Hit every yeah. recreation group yep. and be like, here's mm-hmm. here's my bulletproof PR plan to eliminate your special interest group, right? And we're gonna, we can do it all through Citizens Initiative mm-hmm. because we know there's enough other groups that do not participate and don't necessarily give a shit about your thing that you love. And- it can all be part of a campaign that says this is why this whole citizens initiative stuff needs to be greatly reworked because it can be manipulated yeah. to take away things that don't need to be taken away. In multiple states that I said, you know, 26 have this available to them. There needs to be a revision in some capacity, whether it's on the wildlife side or just on the citizens petition side itself, uh, because it is being manipulated. It's being abused. And, and it's bastardizing so many different things that we're dealing with at so many different levels. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you could talk about oil and gas or wind energy or solar siding or whatever. Everybody thinks it's good until you say that it's going to kill a bunch of wildlife. 
and it, it is good. I mean, I'm not saying that we should get rid of any of it. It just needs to be appropriately managed. But I don't think that you should get, you know, some crazy old women standing up in front of Whole Foods trying to ban everything. Pretty soon we'll all be running around naked and, you know, <laughs> not being able to get what we want. Uh, you know, one of the ways I think that uh, I hesitate to even say this because I'm I'm giving up the I'm like uh, showing the inside thinking, but a, a rhetoric I would use in this is one that when I hear it oftentimes causes me to roll my eyes, but uh, it would be maybe you're not a hunter. You're probably certainly not a bobcat hunter, Mm -hmm. Um, but do you really want these city slickers telling you how to live your life? Mm -hmm. That would want to be, that's very effective to people. I always go like, oh, really, really? But uh, that's what I would be pitching big time. Well, if you look where hot the, tip for you. <laughs> look, look at look at the, where the money comes from, and 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 while we while I say that we've gotten money from fifty states to mm-hmm. help us with this fight, the seed money for these efforts from the opposition has come from out of state. It's out of state big money. Oh, yeah. and 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 because it's coming from the national organizations and the and the lunatic ones that are out there that you know, I mean, you know, you know what polled number one when we did our first poll was Carol Baskins. Off the Tiger King. I mean that that was like, well, we don't want her doing our wildlife. Well, the, oh, I mean that's where that's what people think about wildlife. I don't management. understand what you're saying. So we did our polling. You asked the questions and and trying to get people's attention to figure out where their psyche was, where their impressions were, or perspectives on mountain lion and bobcats. Because you asked the question about Carol Baskins, that polled number one. Where all the other stuff about conservation and economy and wildlife science and the North American model. I mean a disapproval, generally a disapproval of her. Yeah, I see. You know, and okay. but 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 she's she polls number one. Not all the good stuff that we should be talking about. She polls number one. And and we're thinking, well, how the hell? Man, are you I'm sorry, to- I'm, I'm I still don't understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> Steve famously <laughs> didn't engage with Tiger King when that yeah. was happening. No, no, no. Even if let's say I did, <laughs> let's say I did. <laughs> I don't understand. What is the poll like? Wh- so, so when you ask, you you're trying to get a feel or a pulse from the general public about how you would be able to message to that general public and what would resonate with them. I understand. Now. Okay, and they're okay. saying, sorry, I didn't lay it out. If you were now. saying, <laughs> um, like, do you have a favorable impression? Of Baskins as a wildlife manager, yes, they would say resoundingly, "I do not have a favorable impression." Exactly, I understand. But if you said, "What is the most important to you when it comes to wildlife management?" and you re- ranked it A, B, C, and you said the economy, wildlife science, sustainable resources, Carol Baskins, <laughs> <laughs> you throw out there. I mean, Carol Baskins comes in at the top. It's like, well, we don't I want her. Pu- we don't want her managing our wildlife, but they're willing to turn around and take some eighty-five-year-old ex Uber driver. You know, because that person doesn't want anything other than what Carol Baskins does. Yeah. And so we are so disconnected from wildlife, as you all know, for the general public. I mean, they don't know where, where the wildlife management comes from. They don't know the science behind it. You talk to people all the time that, well, I pay my taxes. Well, good. I'm glad. But very little of that goes to wildlife conservation and management. It's from licenses. The sportsmen and women have historically paid that. And it goes from the North American model practices and the, the excise taxes. You can't argue that to somebody that doesn't even understand the circle, the process. Mm-hmm. So you have to figure out a way to talk to them about how hunting and fishing benefits them and wildlife as a whole. 78 game species of wildlife that's managed in, in Colorado. Is it really? They, yeah. You got 961 species of wildlife and 78 of its game species. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. But they, but they, would, they, they don't want any of it. You know, they, it's, they don't want you to harvest any of it for any reason. So where, uh, where does go, or where does the governor of Colorado, Governor Polis fit into this? Is it like, would this all be happening without him in, in not, office? Not to this level. No, this, this, no, this, this, uh, this particular individual, uh, his, his spouse, the first gentleman of Colorado is a animal rights extremist. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And he's got. Well, I would like to say he's got deep pockets. I think they combined have deep pockets. Um, but you you look at the support that they get and the connections that they have. I mean, it's like a giant spider web that what they have as far as the animal rights extremism. And it's not and it's not just about wildlife. It's about everything that has to do with animals. Yeah. His yeah. old man is an animal rights activist. Yeah. 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 Extremist. Terrorist. He He's yeah. inserted 
some people onto the Colorado Wildlife Commission that aren't necessarily pro yeah. correct. Yeah, not necessarily pro. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. That's an understatement. Yeah. But yeah. Um, Which is one way he like he can further his influence on Right. Yeah. And even through the Department of Agriculture. I mean, you just look at appointments straight across the board. The the oversight that's been created with our game management agency because of the extremist mentality, what we consider to be an agenda, that should be paid attention to by people from all around the country as well, because that that model works. You know, you you might not be able to get what you want, but if you put the the, the right people in place, you can get a lot of what you want, mm-hmm. and you can do it in a short period of time just because you're able to turn around and and change the mindset of management and regulatory components, and and how structures. You know, then then legislative you know issues come up to where well. There, this this is more favorable to that administration, so they're maybe more likely to support it. I'm you know I'm concerned. We're sitting around here, and you know, granted, I'm, it seems like the more and more I do this, I become the the oldest guy in the room everywhere I go. But you know, guys like Connor sitting here, I mean, I want him to be able to do what he did, uh, not kill a three hundred eighty six point. No, right? he's got enough of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you to be able to do he that need, for the rest of your life. Doing any more you know, uh, you should be able to kill spikes after this. But, <laughs> yeah. that's about but I want him to be able to do it. And, and while we talk about professing to do something for the immediate future, which is now coming this November, I want him to be able to do it when he's my age. I want his kids to be able to do it. And, and I think that, that that question resonates really, really well with our stakeholder audience that we've got, the hunters and anglers. But it resonates well with the non-hunter, not the anti, but the non-hunter as well, mm-hmm. because they're like, well, maybe my kid would want to go hunting. Yeah. Because my neighbor's kid goes hunting, and he talked about taking him. Or, you know, they, they're doing it in scout camp or they're doing it in some some sort of outward bound deal. And it's it's all preparation for wilderness survival and the, and, and conservation. And the, the there's the American Wilderness Leadership School. We do stuff for the uh, uh, National Rifle Association, Association, the Youth Outdoor Adventure Camp at the Whittington Center. And we sit in kids on scholarships. The, the reason you do that is because you're hoping that you educate them to be able to participate in this and and escalate their in, and enhance their knowledge of the landscape. Well, did you see what they're doing with the kids in Colorado about naming the wolves? Mm-mm. So they had a contest. The governor implemented a contest yeah. to name the wolves that we introduced. Dumped them on the ground. Named them. Had a big contest. That way, because that way, when one of them dies from something, it'll yeah. be like a big... yeah. I mean, how do you like to be the first rancher that has his sheep eaten and you actually kill it under the ten J rule? And somebody says, well, that guy killed Maverick. You know, I mean, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean they're, they're going to be protesting him. They're not going to want to eat his beef. It's this indoctrination, this psychoanalysis yeah, that yeah. they've done. And, and I prefer when they got a name like M O O six. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, B 52. <laughs> but I want to, I want to see our society recognize the need for conservation as opposed to just talk about it. And I really, I think that there's. Well, lots I mean, of, as opposed to a preservation mentality. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, my my grandma used to preserve jam and put it on the shelf, and my my grandfather always used to say, "No, that's conservation because I'm going to eat it. It's, a, <laughs> <laughs> it's we're not putting it there just to preserve it." And uh, but I want to I want to see. I think what, with what we're trying to accomplish, we have a moment in time that we can actually prop up a flag, and I don't want to be all sappy about it, but. It's our, it's our chance as sportsmen and women in the United States to prop up a flag and stop something that could dramatically affect about any other state or any other species or any other method of take or, or season or anything. Because once you start doing statutory regulations and set a precedent, I mean, it's easy for everybody else to go, well, they did it over here. Sure. All we yeah. have to do is change this species or take this out. And I wanted to bring up because you. Well, you, there's two you, things I want to do though. Yeah, so hold ahead. that thought because the two things I want to do is uh, one, I want to explore how certain the outcome is. You might look at this and, and look at some of the demographics we're talking about and look and be like that. You know, the the governor's behind it. Certain uh, certain environmental groups with a lot of name recognition are behind it. It must be that like like hunters are automatically going to lose. But they don't always lose. No. Um, Maine beat a bear hunting ban yep. some years back. Montana uh, beat a public land trapping ban overwhelmingly mm-hmm. recently. Very different 
politics. Right. Arizona is similar to Colorado, and they beat a yep. cat hunting ban. So yeah, they didn't. They didn't even get signatures down there because they did such a, a formidable mm-hmm. campaign to make sure they didn't get the signatures. Yeah. So it's not. That's the bright side. The not bright side is you lose a lot too, and 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 I could name a bunch of states that have lost a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. But point being, the fact that it's on the ballot doesn't mean it's won. No. Like this is going to be decided. It might be tight. But this is going to be something that's decided down the future. Like it's not. This isn't news of something that happened. This is news of something that's coming, and will be addressed in the future. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so that's the first point I want to make, and I want to make as you continue your thought. What is the most productive thing? The most helpful thing that people can do. Give me a bunch of money. Okay. <laughs> I saw and, and, and I and I, and I think, yeah yeah. So, I saw something the other day that was, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it was something like if every person who applies for non-resident elk in Colorado mm-hmm. were to send you twenty dollars, yep, you'd have the what four, is four anticipated. Are you yeah, serious? The yeah. war chest, yeah, yeah, the war chest mm-hmm. sort of amounts. Dude, to I'm like, doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. yeah. And and so like you have a number. Well, Brody's applying. Like, Brody's applying. Is Cal's gonna like this? Brody just found he's gonna apply, he's applying his kids. Oh, mm-hmm. to where? Colorado. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> yeah. he's like, so he, Brody's got to send you sixty bucks. <laughs> yep. Well, you're you're exactly but, right. Yeah, you have a war che- you have a number that you need for a war chest to fight this, you know, effectively. Yeah. And and it's a number that um, people who are spending money on their hunting dreams down the line can can pull together. Without it, too much heartache on anyone's We've part. been working with Howl for Wildlife on a bunch of different things, trying to get a message out. And they, they've got a really unique system to be able to deal with the legislative side of things throughout the country. And they've been really effective over, over the last two years. But they're helping us dramatically on this, which is kind of the first ballot initiative that they've actually engaged in to this degree. Is that right? And, and one of the arguments that we've actually given is, is to your point, it's almost 200,000 non-resident applications that come in. And they're coming in now. It goes all the way, mm-hmm. the deadline's April 2nd. But you have to buy a qualifying license. I think it's 39 to 54 bucks, depending on which one you get. You got to buy preference points. You have to play, pay application fees. If, if every person that put in for the state of Colorado would just take some of what they're already given Colorado that they don't get anything out of unless they draw a license. Mm-hmm. I mean, just you, you don't even, you're, you're putting money in, in for a lottery ticket, but we know that we're not all going to, I mean, you got 11% success out of your deal, but you know, you're an anomaly. So, I mean, the yeah, average, your 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need to hunt Colorado. So <laughs> but, we know the folks are paying the tax at Dermy Bill. Okay. So cough it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to get, get out of here unless you pay ahead of time. So. <laughs> We're, we we have a funding mechanism in the United States with people that apply all around the country just for the opportunity to apply. We're just asking people to help support our cause so we can fight for the opportunity for them to continue to apply. I mean, mountain lions, you know, they don't eat celery and kale. I mean, they eat deer and elk, and wolves are going to do the same thing. Our bear population has expanded significantly. They're going to eat, you know, a lot of deer and elk. You have that many apex predators on the landscape with 5.9 million people and habitat loss and you know, the amount of recreation that we have. Our elk populations and deer populations are not in peril. What are they going to be in 10 years? I mean, we have to do, do some sort of preparation for down the road for sustainable management opportunities. That always irritates people. This is the thing that troubles me. Uh, if you say, like if a hunter, if a big game hunter says, oh, no, 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 no. Um, you know, I welcome predators being on the ground. Oh, yeah. But I like predator control because mm-hmm. I like there to be a lot of deer and elk. A lot of people view that as like a, like a not a defendable position. Right. But it's so funny because you see it reflected um, so widely in the animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. You know, coyotes catch a wolf or uh, wolves catch a coyote, they kill it. Coyotes catch a fox, they kill it. It's sort of this general tendency to exactly. want to be like, no, I'm defending my hunk of the piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. I, but I don't think it's that problematic. Like, I, you know, I, I feel that, that hunters should be like morally emboldened to go and say, um, no, I want to defend high numbers of deer and elk mm-hmm. to support the, 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 the hunting that I want to do. Like I'm after, I'm chasing that number, like high harvestable surpluses of deer and elk. And 
I will take that fight to people that want to degrade habitat, right? Which is going to chip into my right. surplus. I'll take that fight to people that want to degrade any kind of predator control because that's fighting into my thing. And that's what I'm chasing. And that's what I'm interested in. Like that to me is a totally defendable position. I think to be like, I'm pro deer and elk. You're pro deer and elk, but you're pro wildlife period. Sure. Like, you know, I went through the, I don't advocate for, uh, listen, man, never have, never will. I do not advocate for the removal of any native wildlife. No, ever. No. And, and so nor do I, I didn't vote for the wolf deal. Because I don't think it should be should be done by ballot box biology. Sure, it should be done I by that. citizens' initiatives. I mean, if if, if or the, they walk or they walk in, well, like they, they did, like they did, yeah. that we had to turn around and and kind of influence, you know, an ongoing program for that. I don't I don't believe in ballot box biology for any wildlife make a decision. If that's the case, why do we have three hundred and fifty scientists in our agency? Mm -hmm. I don't think that the gal at Whole Foods or the Lyft driver or the guy that drives for UPS or the Rocky, Rockies left fielder. I don't think they should be able to turn around and, and, Is he and a nice guy. And, you know, yeah. It's, I don't think they should be able to turn around and decide what our wildlife management agencies are stuck with. Yeah. I mean, it, it puts them in a, a, such a significant position of trying to do what's right when they're forced to do something that they know doesn't balance with what their management plans on 70 other game species are. Have you seen any, any backlash? Like, in the COVID era, it became like this thing, like, like we always say, trust the science, trust the biologist, but it's also become this thing in the last few years to be like, well, the scientists are full of shit. Like people, it's a thing now where people don't trust the science. And I like, I see that as kind of a challenge when you're like, trust these wildlife management agencies. Cause a lot of people are, have a tendency to not do that trust the science is law i i, I can't say it anymore i know but because you like, know what it, I'm that, saying. yeah but that trust the science thing it, it, it after covid it needs a break because it got yeah. so abused by everybody on all yeah. sides where you like the science is whatever you right heard, so in this argument you know from your buddy at the maybe bar maybe it's a tough position to put you know these agencies in to be like trust trust the well science. but it, but in my argument to that has been uh, follow the science right you got, you got 50, 80, 100 years of data and science and studies and population densities and models and objectives. Look, to me, that's, that's worthy. Sure. When somebody comes out from March 17th of 2020 to March 30th and says, follow the science, wear a mask, get all these shots. Okay, well, two weeks of science really isn't what I want to follow. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's more of what I want you to do. 40, 50, 60 years, I think that that's a track record that you can, you, you can sustainably support. Right. And because, because there's so many other components of that. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people would have no clue that since mountain lions, like across the board where they became managed as game animals, yep. there's way more of them now than there was, say, 80 or 100 years well, ago. And instead, think, instead of trust the science, sorry, Randall, yeah. instead of trust the science, I'd be like, trust the process. It, when you've had similar things happen, we're, we're trying to, uh, with with federal, the federal government trying to influence Alaska's wildlife management practices, mm -hmm. for instance, like home it, but what right do you have to go after them? They have a completely intact menagerie Everything. of wildlife. Yeah. They have wolves and grizzlies occupying like, I don't know what 96% of historic range. They don't have extirpations. They're still trying to go and catalog wildlife. Right. They're not in recovery mode. Where is the criticism? With Colorado Fish Again, like, where is the evidence that they're messing up? Yeah, but even in Alaska, they've tried to, with the whole, like, crawling into dens Well, no, that's thing, what I'm saying. You know? Like, I'm talking about that attack on them. It's yeah. like, where, like, show me where, where Alaska Fish Again, yeah. like, show me where they're screwing up. Or with, with Fish yeah. in Colorado, like, show me where the state is messing up. Can you go and point to me that, 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 is it... What was the FW? What is it there? FWP. It's not FWP. It's C CPW. C yeah, yeah it's change. Yeah, it's Parks in Colorado. Colorado. Okay, whatever the hell. Colorado's <laughs> yeah, Fish and Game Agency, in its in its current form over decades, show me where they have been letting game animals, uh, slip through their grasp, yep. and slip into extinction. Yep. Or slip into extirpation. It's like there's no evidence. Maybe they might make little mistakes. Everyone does. There's no evidence that they're shitting the bed. Right. So it's like, it's trust the science. Again. Like, I don't know. Trust the last 
75 years or whatever the hell it is that they're not like losing. It's not like, Oh yeah, we were supposed to be managing those, but they all, they're gone now. Yep. We didn't even know they were here. (laughs) It's just not happening. Yeah. Like they're not messing up. I think, I think one challenge is like the average person on the street probably thinks of mountain lions as like this rare, inherently endangered threatened (laughs) thing because they don't see them. Right. It's not standing in some ag field as they blow by on the interstate. And so I think like that is probably a big challenge in the educational component is like these animals are thriving over the past however many decades. And it's especially, you know, impactful when you consider all the habitat that's been lost as the front range has grown and all this stuff. Like the average person on the street, I wonder, do they even know like the story of mountain lions in Colorado? I'd wager not. No. And, and to that point, I mean, before the wolf issue came up, when, when the wolf proponents went out and asked, and they've got a video on their website, they went out and asked people about, do we have wolves in Colorado? And, and overwhelming, like people are like, yeah, I think so. Don't we? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'd like to. I mean, and so they were, they were priming the pump for that ignorance. It's not stupidity. It's just ignorance. And I think it's on the mountain lion. Well, that became was, a trick question because some had just shown up. Too. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I think, I think th- that trying to convince people of your, of your perspectives from the misinformation is the way that most of our losses have happened around the country when it comes to wildlife. I mean, you just, like you say, you just, you create this, this uh, fake story out there and you say it enough and pretty much people start to believe it. But, but, and I, and I want to cover this be, because our organizations that we're all members of, that we support, that we're, that we, you know, we get the magazines on a regular basis, all the acronym groups, they do the yeoman's work. I've said this over and over. I'm partners with them, but they haven't done a very damn good job for the last 40 years of talking to the general public. They talk to the sportsman community. Yeah. They talk to the to the agriculture community because they they work close close hand in hand with them. We need to start advertising. We need to start talking regularly to the general public to tell the conservation story and making sure that you know. I mean, every Christmas time, everybody sees the ASPCA and the Humane Society commercials and stuff that are out there. Not all that money goes to you know, helping the little puppies and the kittens. I mean, that's, that's a, that's an advertising ploy. No, All a, of our a, money HSUS go- and local humane societies are, are totally, two different things. Yeah. For a while no. there, there were those hug a hunter campaigns. I'm involved but, um, in that. Yeah. It seems like those things kind of died out. We're doing the, 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 the campaign that you talk about. I'm the chair of the wildlife council Yeah, and I've been on that for seven years. It started in 1998 and that, that changes and morphs into something regularly to differ with public perception because your, your, your demographics that you were talking to between 18 and 34, if you did that 20 years ago, they were, you know, now they're 55 or whatever the hell it is. So, so they have different perspectives and perceptions. Mm -hmm. So they need to be educated differently, but hopefully you did a good enough job on that target audience. But then you've got so many of the other ones that are coming in underneath of that, that they're being, they're, they're able to name wolves, you know, and, and hopefully somebody doesn't kill, you know, Margaret, uh, the, the wolf, because they're going to be bastardized for it. Well, then those kids get a bad perception on on wolf management because yeah. it didn't work, and it's the wolf that they named. Well, if they start doing that with mountain lions and deer and elk and everything else, I mean, why do you think Bambi is such a bad deal? You know, it's because we all grew up and you know Bambi's dad got killed. Yeah, well, man, you, got, you get in the name and box. People name them because they want to get them. Exactly. You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, if a box got a name, you better watch his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I like hug a houndsman. That'd be a good little campaign for Yanni. I'll go give Yanni. Was that a campaign hug. successful? That campaign was extremely successful, and the reason being is because it didn't talk to us in this room. They talked yeah. to the general public. Yeah. That's why it was so successful. Yep. I mean, I joked about it. The reason I got on as the, as the council and I applied because they came up with a talking deer campaign. And I thought, <laughs> okay, this is not the way that we need to they turn They still left Jeff Foxworthy. Yeah. That's a, yeah. <laughs> you know, just like the talking bass on the wall or something. <laughs> uh, but the reason I got involved because I thought that that wasn't the right way to go. And they, the council had that, that one campaign that one year. Um, but the Hug a Hunter deal – that resonated with the people that were out in the field that didn't hunt because they understood where some of that money was coming from so they could actually know that wildlife was taken care of appropriately and that it was on the landscape. Now that we've got a different demographic, our audience has changed. We have a science in the wild campaign that's going on mm. right now. It started November 15th and it's, it's going all the way through this uh, next June. 
Um, but but it is. I mean, you you put you put thirty different people in line, and you put a game warden or somebody with a badge and an emblem and a gun in a truck with a badge on it, and you say, "Who do you trust to manage your wildlife?" People point to the game warden. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't point to the pink haired nose ring extremist. You know, they don't point to me or you because we're standing there doing what we, they, they want the expert taking care of it. And I think pushing that narrative and that tone resonates with the target audience enough to where they go, I want experts to do my work. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that when November 5th comes along with our campaign that we're going to have to do in August, September, and October, I'm confident that the people will, enough of the people will make the right decision because they care about Colorado's wildlife. You know, people all around the country better, better pay attention as well because you've got to figure out a way to, to build up your armament, build up your war chest, and make sure that you prepare for the inevitable. Because like you mentioned, Steve, I mean, it, it, we're not singular. It goes to every state in some capacity. Yeah. You know, I mean, might be crayfish, might be muskrats, might be whatever, but it's, it's going wherever they want to take it that they feel the path of least resistance and they feel a chink in the armor. So uh, at a point, how many months is November away? I don't know. Let me think. Uh, Take me forever. Seven, eight, eight. eight. In eight months, it'll come down to voting. Right now, you made yeah. it. I, I said, what can people do? And you said, uh, you know, jokingly, yeah. but truthfully, truthfully send me I money. Mean, yeah. And the, like, well, where, where does the money need to go? So the money needs to go. You can go onto the website at savethehuntcolorado.com. Okay. And, and there's a couple different options there that you can participate in. The reason that we need the funding is because the extremist, have an endless amount of funding to do a variety of different things. They're fighting, you know, 20 things in, in 20 different states at different levels. We need to be able to go punch for punch, tit for tat with them on advertising because we're both talking to the same audience. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get that middle of the road 80%. We're trying to get the middle of the road 80%. We're going to sway some and they're going to sway some. But look how close the wolf deal was at 51 to 49. If we're anywhere in that ballpark, we're going to win. But we have to be able to, to advertise to that audience and get them to understand, first, about the science, second, about the experts that actually provide the science, and third, how it actually affects those individuals just for they, so they know that they have sustainable wildlife populations on the, on the landscape. Everybody likes to see deer and elk. Everybody likes to see bighorn sheep. You know, that's, you know I did a deal with Shane Mahoney, and, and Shane says, one of the biggest things that all recreationists do is when they go out to recreate, rock climb, without messing up the raptor's nest and everything. Killing uh, every one of yeah, them. Yeah, killing every <laughs> yeah. one of them. But he, but he said everybody that goes out and they see wildlife, the first thing they do is they come home and tell people about the wildlife they saw. They didn't automatically start telling them about their rock climbing incident or, or their mountain bike wreck or whatever, unless they were, you know, bunged up or something. But they, they tell them about the wildlife. They tell them about, I saw a mountain lion, or I heard a wolf, or I saw a moose, or I saw a coyote eat a rabbit. That, because, because we connect with nature once people understand how that connection affects them and where it comes from, they're more likely to support the science and follow the science and, and follow the, the component that has been able to fuel and fund that whole program for the last, you know, 125 years. Mm -hmm. So if they go to SaveTheHuntColorado.com, they can contribute. There's also the initiatives that are on the website that they can look at. Initiative 91 is the one that we're dealing with, even though that's not going to be the final initiative. They'll change the number when they get through the process to put it on the ballot. But we want people to educate themselves and educate their peers and congregation and coworkers and everybody, because without education, we're no better as far as the ignorance on the landscape as well. You know, Yanni, Yanni talked about the, the hound part of it. Read the initiative. It specific, specifically wants to take hound hunting out along with mountain lion hunting, but they talk about electronic e-collars, training collars. They testified during their Supreme Court or their title board hearings, their attorney did that we don't think you should hunt with any dog, period. Read the language in there. They set that as statutory language. What about upland bird dogs? What about waterfowl dogs? What about coon dogs? I mean, the guys are starting to pay attention because they read what it says, not what somebody interprets it. And it's like, well, you, mm -hmm. it doesn't say mountain lion dogs. It gives, says, a, gives a view into their mindset. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you can understand where people should really pay close attention. Um, I, I did a presentation on Saturday to the – Fremont Cattlemen's Association in Colorado. And I, and I said that, and one guy said, well, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does that include stock dogs? I said, well, right now it's not mentioned in here, but why couldn't you turn around and go to an animal cruelty deal because you want to use electronic training devices or collars on your dogs? So it's, 
people need to read into the intent of what they're trying to accomplish with this. They're, they need to understand that it's not singular. They need to understand you could the way it's written, you could take bobcats and mountain lions out and put any other species in, but then look at the other components of that. Educate yourself because these guys are so well structured and their plans are so well formulated that you know, they're looking at New Mexico. They're yeah. looking at Arizona. They're looking at Nevada. Because if they're if they're successful in Colorado, uh, they don't have to go to Colorado again unless it's on another species. So they go to the next state and they start to build that momentum with the legislators. Then the message starts to resonate well with the general public, and pretty soon the lies just take over like locusts on a cornfield. Well, I think uh, you know one thing as we kind of start to wrap up here: broad and diverse coalitions are what really win these fights. Right. So as we narrow way down, right, we already discussed, like if you're the hound hunter representing the hound hunters groups and you're trying to fight uh, a major political campaign like this, you're, you're just, you're outnumbered. You you don't have as much of a voice. So um, a broad, diverse coalition gains your, uh, your, your voice, right. Yeah. And your uh, public awareness of the issue. So, uh, I will tell you, like, if you have pink hair and a nose ring, if you're an old lady at Whole Foods, we want you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Damn straight, we yeah. want you. Like, if you like going outside and you're talking like Shane Mahoney says, you went out and did your thing and you like talking about that wildlife that's out there, you got to understand that this boring story that CPW tells of like no major, like, oh my God, we had to bring something back from the brink. Right. That's because they're out there doing their jobs. Right. And like good conservation stories come from catastrophic failures, like crash of duck numbers, right? We talk about ducks all the time as this huge win, but it's because we damn near killed them all, Mm -hmm. right? We're talking these stories about grizzly bears, but all that stuff in between, it's like, it's been a boring story because we've, we've been winning. We've been maintaining, we're keeping that diversity of habitat. So, um, you need to understand that and appreciate it. We need to get more diverse and more broad and talk to these groups that, you know, at first blush don't align with us. So like, man, if you're a mountain biker, a rock climber, a backcountry skier, um, there, all of these things can be regulated to death and little fights like this have broad implications, right? So broader Go- groups. Government oversight is one thing, extreme oversight from the general public to some degree, and I'm talking a very minute section of the general public, that extremism is what's going to alter Mm -hmm. so many different things that people look at when it comes to outdoor recreation and conservation and wildlife management, because there's a small group that has the squeaky wheel and and they're well-funded. And the majority of our community just wants to go hunt. We just want to turn around and go scout and check our game cameras and get ready for season and do it. I mean, what we're talking about right now is the, the least entertaining component of your of your deal your 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 dog deal the story your elk hunt nobody wants to listen to this crap but they have to listen to it if they expect to be able to turn around and have the story that you had and have the story that you have and and to be able to do that what you did not not what you did but when i'm not that big you, yeah not that big no. go back to the spike <laughs> reasonable yeah it's where you can do 40 <laughs> years of spike hunting <laughs> and then but but if we want to actually engage in that conversation there has to be a component of buy-in from the general public. And I think that the public is there and wants to be educated. We, we're seeing that on this level, the people that are reaching out at so many different levels. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many people just walk up to you and go, hey, I heard, or hey, I saw you, or hey, I was told. And they want to be, be they want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of, of the victory, not part of the problem. All right, well, hit, them, hit them again with where to go. Okay, savethehuntcolorado.com. There's a couple different opportunities there. You can actually... You can actually get into a couple different raffles that SCI is running to help fund this measure. They're giving any guns out. He can get a better working gun. Uh, yeah, there is. A, a Gunworks gun is on there. Uh, there, there you go, buddy. You want to talk about shooting yeah, some there's elk a gun off. So, so, so you can give me your $50. He perked, he perked right up. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, now, you can go on there. You can donate. You can look at everything that we're doing as far as videos and stuff. You can go on Instagram and Facebook and find us. Uh, CRWM is on Instagram and Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management on Facebook. I do want to mention something if you got time. Yeah, because, because of the lies and deceit. I'm going to re- read you this, and 
I want you guys to give me your impression. This is the ta- the ballot title for Denver this year, just for the city and, and county voters of Denver. It says, shall the voters of the city and county of Denver adopt an ordinance concerning a prohibition of fur products and in conjunction beginning July 1st of 2025, prohibiting the manufacture, distribution, display, sale, or trade of certain animal fur products in the city and providing limited exceptions to the prohibition. They're talking about leather too? No. No. But they're talking about <laughs> beaver felt cowboy hats. They're talking about fly fishing material. Yeah, there's and a lot fly of fly shops. shops. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> when I asked about leather, I was just being cute because somehow once you take the fur off, everybody's cool with it. Oh, yeah. But you start, you, when you start, it, it doesn't say that until yeah. you read it in the measure. This is what they'll vote on for the title. You read it in the measure and you go, what do you mean? In Denver, you can't buy a cowboy hat? It's the death of the elk hair caddis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, look at all the mink and the beaver stuff that's put on the on the fly fishing lures and on the fishing lures and stuff. You start you start putting in there's a, there's a component into that deal that they they made exceptions or exemptions because they did, they wanted to be uh, hit, um, politically correct. Mm. So Native Americans can sell their artwork and their crafts in the city of Denver. But you have to be white or non-native to be able to buy it. Well, how many times did the Denver March Powwow or the Indian Market do you see that Native Americans are selling to Native Americans? Maybe a little bit. But if, you, if you're white and you want to go there, you can't buy it because it says you have to be indigenous to be able to do it. Uh-huh. They are feeding off of the lies and deceit of the general public. On that, the Slaughterhouse Band, the Mountain Lion and Bobcat Band, and I hope that the general public wakes up, not just in Colorado, but these things go on all around the country. Yeah. And people go, well, oh, that happened in Cleveland, or that happened in Dallas, or that because it didn't affect them. It's happening everywhere, and we have to figure out a way to plant our, our flag, draw a line in the sand, and say, if the science says that we shouldn't, then maybe that's what we should look at, especially from a conservation standpoint. Yeah. But, I mean, you guys have, a, you guys have the ability to... Uh, you know, give a synopsis, a synthesize things that are going on in the landscape. I'd encourage people to reach out at every level to say, hey, there's something going on in Washington, D.C. or something going on in Sacramento. Because the average person doesn't know. And I'm not trying to, you know, jump your inbox up. You probably already have that enough or, as it is. But I don't look at it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sorry <laughs> Corinne. <Yeah. laughs> but no, we, we, we appreciate the opportunity to, to, to kind of bring a little bit of message to light because it's something serious enough in Colorado that if we fall in Colorado this year, you're going to see a lot of other things happen behind this because it's easy to turn around and, and take their momentum, momentum and move it to the next level. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on. Appreciate the time. Tell, tell the much. site, tell where to go one more time. Save the hunt, Colorado.com. It's the Coloradans for responsible wildlife management. And uh, you can get a lot of information on there, but if they got, if they have wishes, wants, and desires, they could reach out and contact us through the email chain on there as well. Great. Yeah, do it at the same time that you're applying for your Colorado elk yep. tag. Just mm-hmm. then pop over to CWRM and give them 20 bucks. CRWM. CRWM. Give them 20 bucks. All right, Dan Gates, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the work you're doing. Thank you very much. It's the me. the me